And now, your host, the captain of conspiracy, the prince of paranormal. This ain't your daddy's radio network show. This is Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, ha, oh. That's right. It's Friday night. This is Fade to Black. All right. Let's get comfortable. Today's Friday, March 28th. 87 days into the new year. As always, live from the JP Motorsports Studios right here in Burbank, California. For KJCR and the Dark Matter Radio Network, I am your host, Jimmy Church. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get it cracking. Cracking number one. Big salute. To the men and women in uniform, the proud men and women in uniform all around the world, fighting the good fight for us. Without them, there is no me, there is no you, there is no us. And you couldn't hear me right now. Think about it. And I mean it. What a great week we've had here on the show. Dark Matter Radio Network. It is the place to be these days, isn't it? And what a way to wind up the week with the show that we have lined up tonight. So let's get it cracking. <laughs> Today, actor Vince Vaughn, 44 years old. You know, and I say this all the time, but but I really mean it. These birthdays give you a glimpse into my character. Good, bad, ugly, indifferent, doesn't matter. Because that includes this next actor. Diane Wiest is 66 years old today. And her best lines, or best line, and one of the greatest lines ever in cinema was, Don't speak. Don't speak. From Bullets Over Broadway. <laughs> what a great movie. She totally slayed in that one. And today, nobody died. I've got no dead guys today. So let's move on. Follow us on Twitter, at J Church Radio. Simple, at J Church Radio. If you're over on the website right now, just click on it. Follow us. Facebook. Twitter, YouTube, like, follow, subscribe. You know what to do. All of the shows, we, we do it two different ways here, but they're, they're both the same thing. It just depends on how you like to navigate. But over at uh, JimmyChurchRadio.com, you can just go to the, uh, what did we call it? Replays? I don't know. It's the last page. All of the shows are there. And then, of course, you can just go straight to YouTube, which is KJCR Fade to Black. And we post everything. And we get up. We, we usually get everything up by the end of the day tomorrow. It, uh, on Saturday. It takes a good 12, 14 hours to do three three-hour shows. Get them rendered, edited, finished up. All the video stuff. And get it up there. But we eventually get it done by tomorrow. Usually. All right. Tonight, uh, we'll see if we can get some open lines in. We're going to have a busy night tonight. But if uh, you hear me say open lines, you know what to do. 323-825-5045. You can email throughout the show tonight. I encourage it. Pierce the producers. And get to me. 
Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. You can do it all over the website. You can do it on the contact page if you you want to do something a little anonymous, discreet, encrypted. You can do it there on the contact page, or you can just do it direct. Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Make it good. If it's good, it gets to me. Bumper music tonight, as always, is Doug Aldrich. What you're listening to right now is Mark D. Kovar, but I wrote it. <laughs> uh, tonight, David Sheehan and Costas McCreese from E.T. Let's Talk. It's going to be an absolutely phenomenal show tonight. These guys uh, are incredible. And we're talking about pedigree. It's going to be a great show. Let's go through some headlines. Uh, interesting stuff going on. And and again, like I said yesterday, today we're going to be the same as yesterday with uh, Malaysian Flight 370. Nothing's changed. They've got a new search area. They've seen a bunch of stuff. Nothing's been picked up. We've got two uh, P-8 Orions flying around, or whatever they're called, from the United States. Uh, I said yesterday that uh, all the China pictures were from the wrong ocean. <laughs> and I, 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 I just, I, I can't believe it. And today we are in the exact same spot. I'm watching the talking heads all day long with nothing new. I, I, I don't know what to make of it. I, I really don't. And I said yesterday in the show, and I mean it, I'm going to say it right now. If that was the United States, would we, would we, if that was an, an American carrier, uh, a uh, United States carrier, would we put up with the shenanigans going on from China, Malaysia, Australia? Would we be putting up with this? We wouldn't. If that was the United States failing at this, no, we wouldn't put up with it. I if, if that was Russian, would Russia be acting like this? I don't think so. The plane would have been found. Submarines, the full force of the United States wouldn't have two. We don't even have any boats over there in the United States right now. And that's shocking to me, too, as well. We're just... It's like we want it to be on the bottom of the ocean. We don't want to find it. That's how I feel. And if that's the case, then why? Why? Interesting, isn't it? All right. Let's get to some fun stuff. Uh, go over to JimmyChurchRadio.com right now. Go to the, go to the website. Got a couple of pictures uh, that uh, I had posted. Scroll down. There's a gallery. It says Jimmy Rant. <laughs> and I didn't write that. Shows you the, the respect that I get around here. Jimmy Rant. There's three pictures there. Go to the first one. That is a UFO that was shot in Chile. Go check that picture out. Got this from the Black Vault. Our good friend, uh, John, uh, over at the Black Vault, who just, hey, John, uh, if you're listening, uh, congratulations on the arrival of your son. And uh, the pictures look great. He actually looks just like you. It's kind of scary. And uh, uh, we're, now, now that his son and the birth is out of the way, and congratulations to John and his wife. But now he's available to come on the show. So we're working on that now. It's funny. He lives down the street and it's, <laughs> I can get somebody on the show from London. No problem. Gets, get a neighbor of mine here in Burbank. And it's, it's <laughs> anyway, this shot from Chile uh, is from the Black Vault. It's a flying object as large as two soccer stadiums. The UFO was seen at the El Yeso Reservoir was twice the size of the National Stadium in Chile. It's left more than 
one person startled in that country. And their uh, their organization, which is called CEFA, C-E-F-A-A, confirmed its authenticity. The image was taken in an area known as the El Yeso Reservoir by a Venezuelan couple living in in uh, Chile. And it was investigated by its director general, General Ricardo Bermudez. Check that out. And what do you make of that? Incredible. Now, go to the two shots next to it. There's a black and white pick. And there's a color pick right next to it. Those are the same object. That's a triangular UFO. This is also from Black Vault. Just posted. And that was shot over Texas. Now, it's not a triangular UFO, is it? No, it's not. But is that Aurora? Take a good look at that. And look at the uh, chemtrail coming off of the back, that vapor trail. Clear blue sky... It's uh, taken above Amarillo, Texas. And the guy that took the picture, um, his name is Stephen, Steve Douglas, spends a lot of time in Texas taking pictures of the sky. And he also has a way of monitoring radio traffic. And he recorded and picked up the radio traffic between that plane and the tower which means it's not remote, and it was ripping. That's not a F-117. No, that's not, they, don't, they don't travel like that and look like that. That is an incredible picture, both of them. And uh, you can go over to the Black Vault and, and check it out, but uh, it's the same information that we have here. But those are really cool, and I haven't seen, if, 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 if that is finally Aurora, it's like one of the first one of the first pictures. You can search Aurora all over the net to the cows come home, and you're not going to find anything like that. And that is incredible. Uh, scientists scientists are going to attempt. This is from ArtBell.com. Thank you, Keith. By the way, over at ArtBell.com, scientists are going to attempt to clone. A forty-three thousand year old woolly mammoth. Now I had heard I had heard the the breaking on the story last week. Now we've got a little bit more detail. An international team of researchers in Russia are looking at this skeleton. Now, it, it, well, it's not a skeleton; it, it's intact. And if you go over to artbell.com, I was going to post the pictures over here, but it was just easier if you go to Art Bell, and and I think you're going to end up on Geek.com where there's some uh, more pictures, but look at this woolly mammoth this thing looks like it died yesterday. And the researchers were saying that it is more intact than a six month old human skeleton. If it was buried today, it's fresh. They have enough meat muscles, living tissue to extract DNA for real. This is real. This is not a joke. They've got living cells. Now, the trick is to make sure that they have a DNA chain. We have the technology now to replace anything in that DNA strand to make it right and correct for cloning. All they got to do is go in and repair any minor damage of the snippets, the DNA, on both sides, with an elephant and with a mammoth. If they fix it, it's called uh, automated genome engineering multiplex mage. Get it all done, and then the next step is to insert into an elephant embryo to, to develop in a modern elephant in the womb. We are there. Now, are there ethics involved with this? Are there? And, uh, uh, no, is the answer. 
mammoths, and it, it what, what is strange for all of us, mammoths, we kind of think about, uh, you know, dinosaurs. But they went extinct 4,000 years ago. You know, pretty much modern man hung out with mammoths. So I, I just don't, I don't find any ethical issues. You know, is it going to be Jurassic Park? No. I say get it done. And uh, crank one over there to uh, downtown L.A., the L.A. Zoo, Griffith Park. I want to go check me out a mammoth. And we're close. And and, and I think they're going to do it. I, there's no reason for them not to. Incredible. Just incredible. Vlad, Vladdy Putin, the guys that know him, we call him Vladdy. Vlad, Vladimir, called President Obama today. He called Obama. Now, you know, there's this whole pissing match going down between these two guys. And uh, supposedly they don't like each other. I can believe that. But, you know, who cares? They're politicians. They got to do what they got to do. But Vlad called today, called the White House, called the hotline to talk to Obama. And I'm not making this up, by the way. Called Obama because he's got. He wants to talk about the Ukraine. And Obama responds back and apparently they're gonna they're gonna strike a deal. There's something going down. And I have a couple of ideas here. But what I think is Vlad needs a little bit of a land bridge to go between Russia and Crimea. Think about that. Needs to build a road. Needs to needs to have access. I think that's what's going on. He's not going to invade the Ukraine. <clears throat> he just wants a little land grab. But meanwhile, during this conversation today, he lines up another 25,000 good-to-go dressed troops in addition to what he's already got there. Crazy. Vlad is nuts. <laughs> Absolutely nuts. Mirage Men made its uh, debut yesterday. And uh, I want to hear I want to hear what everybody has to say. Did you watch it? If you didn't, you still can. We're going to leave it up there for a while. But uh, I want to know. Shoot me an email, jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. And uh, let me know what you think. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Bill Cooper. Been talking about him the last couple of days. And the mad man love that I have for that guy. <laughs> I don't want to make it too apparent. Um, but I watched a documentary last night, and I watched that famous speech that he did up in Lansing, Michigan. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't know why. This, this past couple of weeks I've been sucked into the, because I've always liked him. I always thought he was really intelligent. I don't know how he manages to uh, have a, had a vocabulary and the ability to speak uh, like he did. But I'm going to uh, reach out to uh, his two co-hosts on the Hour of the Times, Hot I want to get those guys on the show. So I'm reaching out. We'll see what we can do over the next couple of weeks. And with that, let's uh, take our first break. And when we come back, we will have Daniel Sheehan and Costas. Oh, wow. Hey, Keith. <laughs> I did lose audio. Uh, I lost my music. Keith, right? Run some music. Give me uh, three minutes if you got me. I'm looking at your cue here. Give me two minutes of music so I can get my guys on, and uh, we'll take a quick break. And uh, we'll be right back with Daniel Sheehan and Costas McCreese. And that's about it. Shoot me an email. Uh, okay, I'm clear. Cool.
<laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks for catching that. Thanks for catching that. I was moving files over to the laptop and I forgot about it. I spaced it. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, let me get these guys on the line and I'll, I'll text you. I'm muting. Stay with me, Costas. I'm going to run some promos. <laughs> of which you owe me one or two. Okay, Daniel, I'm bringing you online. You're going to be on hold for about a minute, okay? Hang on. Oh, he's on the most wonderful landline you've ever heard in your life. And Costas is, is Skype. So I got a landline and I got Skype. Okay. Uh, he, um, check this out. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you about it. He got one of those Beats headsets. You're going to be surprised. <laughs> You're not going to recommend this. <laughs> All right, let's go. Uh, Ten seconds. What? Okay. Uh, okay. I, I won't be able to hear it. Okay. You got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Welcome back. Fade to black. Friday. All right. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We're on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Get the email coming. I've got uh, three or four lined up already. Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Let's get it cracking, everybody. We are ready to go. Daniel Sheehan graduated Harvard Law in 1967. He worked as an attorney for the Karen Silkwood case and many other prominent cases such as the Pentagon Papers. Sheehan later co-founded the Christic Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to social justice causes, where he uncovered the Iran-Contra affair and took on other high-profile cases against the government. Today, Daniel is working with the Sioux tribes in South Dakota to stop the state practice of removing Native American children from their families. Mr. Sheehan has now joined etletstalk.org as their legal counsel. Costa McCreese is an international networker, author, organizer, and creative artist for peace. He is a co-founder of ET Let's Talk and founder of the People's Disclosure Movement and the Global ET Contact Initiative. In 1977, he earned a BA in computer science from Indiana University. That's what I'm talking about. He doesn't know what I'm from Indiana. In his professional life, Costa has enjoyed a broad and successful career as a software consultant to many Silicon Valley companies. It is his deep, lifelong interest in the world peace and positive planetary transformation that compels him these days to teach everyday people how to contact, connect, communicate, and interact with galactic civilizations who are now visiting Earth at this time. David and Costa, I'd like to welcome you both to the show. I'm going to bring you in now. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you? 
Five. Uh, who's going to? Okay. That was, <laughs> this, da- that was Danny. Costa. Thank you. It's that a pleasure to be here, this Jimmy. Is Dan- this is Danny over here. Okay. You guys sound great. Um, uh, fantastic. Thank you both uh, for joining us tonight. It's going to be a great night. And uh, <laughs> we look forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I start off every show the same way, which is this. We're just going to talk. Just you guys are guests in my living room. We're drinking coffee or whatever. And wherever the conversation ends up, it's going to be interesting. And that's what our audience is looking forward to. And if it's interesting to the three of us, then somebody's going to learn something tonight, and that's what's most important. Somebody's typing on a keyboard. You can't do that during the show. I'm, I'm going to smack fingers. Ah, okay. That hurts. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, a couple of things. Uh, I have no in- agenda here. There are no uh, 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 questions, anything premeditated, and it's free form. But one of the exciting things for E.T. Let's Talk is the addition of, of Daniel. And so I, I want to, if, if you don't mind, uh, Costa, uh, I, I would like, is it, is it okay, Costa, if I just talk to Daniel for a second? Absolutely. <laughs> hey, it's your show. It's your life. Your karma. Uh, awesome. <laughs> in, in that, um, uh, I, I didn't get a chance to tell you, Daniel, but I, I mentioned this to Costa earlier um i had a meeting with a couple of my attorneys uh on monday uh in beverly hills and so we're sitting in this really nice corner office overlooking rodeo drive and we're talking about this and that and 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 as always you know we start talking about the show and i brought you up that you were going to be the guest this week i'm not going to say their names it's there it wouldn't be right but they were like oh no way you know, and, and see, you know, the, uh, uh, all attorneys seem to know each other. I don't know. You guys hang out at some place that we don't know anything about. And you guys go and you hang out and you, and, and you do your thing. But you're well respected. And, and I have to say, uh, the, uh, for, for Costa and for E.T., Let's Talk, they must be so excited to have you in their corner um, but what is it that uh, what is it that you're exactly doing for them? That's the first question, and the second question this kind of comes in from uh, our good friend Renee in Tucson. Um, did have have you had an experience in the past uh, that you may want to talk about uh, uh, an ET well, experience, or is there something that that drew you to ET? Well, actually, the uh... I, I have I have always had a sense since I was you know seven years old since you could stay out at night and look at the stars and recognize what an awesome experience this whole thing is that you it was perfectly clear to me very early on that there were a substantial percentage of the stars that were that were visible in our galaxy that had other planets around them and that it was extremely likely that there were there were other intelligent life on the planet and it always struck me as a is an extraordinarily important perspective to maintain, to realize that that uh, the some of the strange and bizarre things that we do as a human family here on our planet, where whereby we draw you know a line in the dirt with a stick and say if you step over this I'm going to kill you, uh, or you know starve people out or attack people. It just seems absurd when you sit beneath the stars at night and realize that we're one of many millions of of, uh, of planetary systems. And so the, I realized this very early on. Uh, but when I, I was first contacted about this was back in 1977, just uh, back, actually 76, just shortly after President Jimmy Carter was elected uh, in November of 1976. And I, I was having, actually, I was actually having a, a, a lunch with uh, Rosemary Chalk, who was the executive secretary of the National uh, Science Foundation. And uh, she, she happened to comment. She said, look, this is extraordinary, the kind of legal cases that you've done. You've represented the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case. You're the one that initiated the case to establish the right of journalists to protect our confidential news sources. It went all the way to the United States Supreme Court where you were still a second-year law student. You, know, you founded the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review, and you established the, you know, the, 
the right of, of unmarried people to have access to birth control information by striking down the laws, restricting it to, to married people. And, you know, you, you, you must have been born to be a lawyer. You must have always wanted to be a lawyer. And I said, well, actually not. I was originally going to go to the Air Force Academy because I wanted to become an astronaut and go into space and be able to participate in reaching out to establish contact with the other civilizations that are in outer space. And she was kind of dumbfounded, and she said, huh. you know, uh, you've got to talk to Marsha Smith, who's a very dear friend of mine, and Marsha is the head of the Science and Technology uh, Division of the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress. And it turns out, she related to me, that as soon as President Carter was elected in November of 1976, he called in uh, the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, which at that time was George H.W. Bush, who had been appointed to be the CIA director for Gerald Ford after he took over when Richard Nixon resigned in 1974. And so, so Jimmy Carter, the president-elect, asked the CIA director, George H.W. Bush, to give, turn over to him the files about extraterrestrial intelligence and UFOs. Because as most of your listeners know, President Carter actually saw uh, what he believed to be a UFO with uh, several other people when, when he was in the, in the state of Georgia. So he, he asked, as the President of the United States, to have this information given to him, and George H.W. Bush refused to give it to him. Uh, he actually said, what he said to him was, look, I would like you to leave me on as your CIA director so that I could become sort of the perennial director of the CIA, whether Republicans or Democrats are in the White House, sort of like J. Edgar Hoover had become when he was the longtime director of the FBI. But President Carter told him, no, no, he, he had his own person in mind to be the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, and so he wasn't going to agree to appoint him. And so George... George Bush said, well, then I'm not going to give you the information. You know, you're not the president yet, and you don't have any need to know this yet. And so he refused. And, uh, and he continued to refuse, even when he stayed in the office of the CIA director after Carter came in, because when, when Carter came in, uh, Carter had uh, nominated uh, to, to be the director of the Central Intelligence Agency uh, a, a person who the Congress rejected. And so the Republican Congress filibustered him. And so that, that George Bush stayed on as the CIA director for some months into the Carter administration, and he still refused to give the, the, the extra information about extraterrestrial intelligence and the UFO phenomenon. So what happened is, is President Carter, out of frustration, contacted the, the, library, the Congress, the, the Science and Technology Committee of the, of the House of Representatives, and asked them if they would contact the Library of Congress and have them file papers to declassify information to give to, give to the president. That's how this happened. So Marsha Smith was contacted by the Congressional Research Service and uh, asked to prepare a major study, uh, a classified study, that was going to be given to the president uh, addressing two specific issues. One was what the uh, the judgment was, uh, the best research judgment was, as to the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence. And secondly, uh, their best judgment as to these many reports of UFO sightings. What were they? Where would they come from? What was the best judgment as to what they were? And so that Marsha Smith, as the head of the Science and Technology Division of the Congressional Research Service, had this responsibility. And so... So uh, Rosemary Chalk said, look, it, would you be willing to take a call from Marsha Smith? I was chief counsel for the Jesuit National Headquarters at the time in Washington, D.C., and uh, she said she'd like to talk with you. So Marsha Smith called me and asked me whether I, as the general counsel for the Jesuit order in the United States, would contact the Vatican Library in Rome and see if they would allow me to go and get access to the uh, the Vatican Library, and the sections of the Vatican Library that that had the information about UFOs and whatever the the, the Catholic Church's position was on extraterrestrial intelligence, and so I wrote the letter to ask them for that information, and much to my surprise, they said no, I couldn't have it. So I sat down and wrote a very formal letter and said, 
let's. I, I want to be clear about this. You know, I'm I'm the chief counsel for the Jesuit Order of the United States. We have ten provinces here, more than any place else in the world, with the largest order in the in the in the church. Right. And we're being asked by the president of the United States to get this information so he can have access to it. You know, I want you to give me the information. And they said no. And so so uh, we were kind of crestfallen, Marsha and I. But what happened very shortly thereafter, Marsha called me and said that the Congress had cut half of all of the money out of the national budget for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, their SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, the, the, the uh, exploring of the skies, looking for radio signals from uh, other planets that would reflect intelligent communications. And, uh, and she wanted to know whether I would go with a number of the astronauts uh, as the chief counsel for the Jesuits and lobby for the restoration of the full budget. And I did. I went with, uh, with three of the other astronauts, and we went and we got the, all the money restored. And so the top 50 scientists at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, in Pasadena, asked me to come out and give them a three-hour closed-door uh, seminar as chief counsel for the Jesuit order, uh, a, a seminar on the theological implications of contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. And in preparation for that, I contacted Marsha Smith and I said, look, uh, in order to prepare this for the scientists, uh, I'd like to be able to see whether you, in your capacity as the head of this major study, could get me access to the classified portions of Project Blue Book the top-secret uh, United States Air Force uh, investigation of UFO phenomenon. She was not very optimistic about them being willing to do that, but she filed the application. Well, much uh, uh, of our surprises. Uh, yeah, David, really quick. When you say yeah. the classified section, did yeah. you know that there was a classified section that nobody oh, yeah. else knew? Oh, yeah. Where, no, no, I, well, I, knew that, I knew there was a classified section. The Project Blue Book. Well, how did I, you find how did you find out that information at that time? Because it was a different world back then. Well, the, the, we we knew that they had they had uh, issued a, a piece of a public report saying that you know they had they had explored you know all these uh, allegations and they found all of them were like ball lightning or swamp gas and, and they basically poo pooed us. But there but it turns out that it was clear when you read the when you read the report. They they'd indicated that there were several thousand reports, and they only covered like about a couple hundred of them. Right. And so that you knew perfectly well that there was another corpus of information that they weren't talking about. And so I asked Marsha if she would file an application to allow me to get access to the classified sections. And lo and behold, uh, within a matter of a couple of weeks, she gets back the response that they will allow me to see it. So. I, w I was invited over to the new wing of the Library of Congress, the Jefferson Building. It, no one had even moved in there yet. It was brand new. Uh, it was, it, they, they, the, there was not a single person had their offices in there yet. But I was invited over on a Saturday morning shortly thereafter. I had to go over to the, to the building and uh, show my identification. You know, these two suits there waiting for me. And I showed them who I was, and they invited me in. I walked into the building. They brought me to an elevator. I went down this elevator into the basement and then down this long hall, and here are these other two suits over there by, the, by this room, uh, you know, with earplugs in and all that whole nine yards, right? And so I went over and, uh, told, and showed them my identification again. They were all kind of gruff and insisting I show the identification again, and I did. And then they told me that I couldn't bring my briefcase in, but I happened to have a yellow pad under my arm. And so they took my briefcase away and, and held it there, and I went in, and they said, you can't take any notes uh, or anything. So I went in, and there were, there were a, a few, three tables there, and they had these stacks of uh, like shoeboxes-sized things, kind of this pale, uh, light green color, and they were filled with microfiche. And so what I did is I, I took one of them out, and I started putting them into the, this old microfiche thing, you know, the little hand crank on the Yeah, thing. the reader, like, sure. Like a reader. And uh -huh. started looking through these things, saying, look, at, I don't know how long they're going to let me have to do this. They didn't say. So I was kind of trying to go through them to find something very conspicuous. And after about the third box of these things, I, I came across these photographs. 
And here they were. There were these there were these completely clear photographs of a UFO that had crashed in a field, and you could see that it had plowed. It was, there was snow on the field. You could see they plowed this big trough through the through the field, and the UFO was stuck like at a 45 degree angle in this great big mud bank with snow over it. It was sticking out like at a 45 degree angle, and you could see in the photographs you could see United States Air Force personnel in these great big uh, jackets, these snow jackets with a big fur around the top of the hood, and, uh, and you, you couldn't, I couldn't quite make out their name tags, but you could see they were Air Force. I knew, I recognized the Air Force uniforms. And, and one of them, actually, you could see in the picture with a, a, a camera, a, tel- uh, a, it was a film camera with those two great big round canisters on the top of it. Right, right. Which means that it must have been like in the 50s or something that this t- took place. And and I, I saw this this UFO, and I said, "Holy mackerel! There's not any doubt about what that is. Look oh, what it is." Oh, oh, okay. so n- now you're dumbfounded. I'm dumbfounded right now. Uh, yeah. Okay. I was, I was, well, well, I, hold on. <laughs> I want to know what. I want to know what. Okay, let me ask you some details. How how yeah. big? Uh, since there were um, uh, Air Force Guys personnel, right yeah, yeah. yeah. I, how, how big of a craft are we talking about it, here? It, it must it must have been probably. 40 feet or so wide. Uh, it, it, it was a classic saucer. Say, it had the dome on the top of it in the, in the kind of flat saucer thing. It was stuck nose first into this big snowbank sticking out at like a 45 degree angle. And I could see in, in the first photograph that I saw, the first photograph was kind of far away where I could see the Air Force personnel all around it. And then I clicked it, I, I cranked it over and I got another picture there of it. And I could see a closer look at it. And I could see around the bottom of the dome, there were like these symbols. And I said, whoa, take a look at this, man. And so what I did is I, 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 put the, I filled the, the whole uh, frame up with the picture. And then what I did is I, I zoomed in on, I magnified it to zoom in on the symbols around the base of the, of the dome so that I could see them. And what I did is I, I looked to make sure nobody was looking, and I took the yellow pad out from under my arm, and I laid it down, and I opened it up to the, to the cardboard so that on the inside, in the very back of the yellow pad, on the inside of the, the cardboard, I put that on, and I, I shrunk the picture right down to fit the exact size of the back of the cardboard, and I traced the actual symbols that were along the base of this particular, uh, the particular dome. And so I, I traced them all, and then I, I closed the yellow pad up, and I said, holy mackerel, I said, I better get out of here so I don't get in trouble and get caught doing this. So I put, the, I put the, the little microfilm back in and closed it up and put it in the box, and I walked back out, and, uh, and uh, I asked for my briefcase, and they said, okay, and they gave me the briefcase. And I started walking down the hall, and then one of the two guys said, hold it, what's that you've got there? And I said, this is just my briefcase. He said, no, under your arm, what is that? I said, that's just a yellow pad. And he said, I told you no notes. And he goes over, he comes walking over to me, and he snatches the yellow pad away from me. And he opens it, and he starts riffling through all the, the yellow pages. But they're blank. And, but they were blank, completely. And he went, rah, 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 and he gave it back to me. And so, so I take it and put it under my arm and walk out of the place, right? And I go, I go back over, and Monday morning I come into the Jesuit headquarters, and I go to see Father William J. Davis, who was the Jesuit uh, superior that I had. And I went to talk to him, and I showed him what I had, and I explained to him what the picture was I had. And he got the strangest look on his face, and he reached down, and he slid open the, the drawer of his desk, and he pulled out an envelope, and he pulled out a photograph of a UFO. And he said that this was from his sister, his sister's husband was a, a, uh, a tra- air traffic controller at the Seattle, Washington airport. And his best friend, who was a commercial pilot, took this photograph out the window of his commercial aircraft. And he took the photograph and he said he, he didn't want to get in any trouble or anything, so he just gave it to his best friend, who was an air traffic controller. He said, here, I just wanted to make sure that I gave it to somebody official, so you've got it. And he, the guy brought it home and showed his wife, and he didn't know what to do with it. And so she had it, and so she decided she was going to give it to Bill Davis, her brother, because he's a Jesuit priest, and therefore they felt exonerated. They, they'd done something to give it 
to a, an appropriate person. And so he had had it in his desk all this time, and he took it out and gave it to me. And so, so what I did is based on that, I built Father Bill Davis and I at the Jesuit headquarters in 1975 and 76. We had helped organize a thing called the Washington Interreligious Staff Council. As it turns out, that there are 54 separate religious denominations in the United States that have Washington, D.C. offices that monitor the legislative process. So what we did is we gathered them all together at the National Council of Churches at 110 Maryland Avenue, uh, and we brought them into a meeting, and I told them what I had seen and showed them the picture that Father Bill Davis had and said that I wanted them to agree to form a task force so that they, as the collective churches in the United States, could, would, in, in synagogues, uh, and they were, they were, you know, everybody from the Methodists to the Baptists to the Unitarians to the Church of Christ to the Union of American Hebrew Congregations to the Unitarians to the, the Catholics. and the, We had them all, all there, basically. Uh, at that time, there were no Muslims uh, in, the, in the organization. But what, what uh, I asked them, if they, would, if they would agree to have a task force to look into this and try to develop a position a theological position, what, what, was, what was going to be the impact of realizing that there were these an extraterrestrial civilization? And I, I, I remember, I remember uh, Judy Stone, who was from the United Methodist Church, was chairing the meeting, and so there was this big, long pause, and then she looked around at everybody and she said, okay, are there any other ideas? Does well, anybody, else, okay. anybody else have some ideas? Where, uh, they, they, would, they didn't do it. Okay. They wouldn't do it. Where is that cardboard piece from the uh, legal I, pad I today? It. I have it in my files. Who, has, who, files. who has seen that? Any, well, any, Father, Father Bill Davis and I have seen it. The, the people at the, uh, the Washington Interreligious Staff Council have seen it. Uh, I, I assigned my people to try to find this thing because people have been starting to ask me about it since I started talking to the people here. At but, 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 but main, I'm talking about, uh, I understand that, but has, has the, has any mainstream media seen this cardboard, uh, no. the, the letters? No. Okay. Because I'm, cause I'm, I'm positive they won't do anything about it. Well, I, I mean, will. They, they know all kinds of stuff. Okay. Well, stuff. well, well I, I, I'm your guy, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's, uh, I want to see that. Um, we can keep it in confidence. The whole world no, no, knows no, I, about I'm, it. I'm perfectly happy to get it. I, I've asked my staff to go find all of my Jesuit files. Uh, you know, I've got like 45 years of case files, uh, which we've got all all stacked up in the offices. So I said, look, at the, the people from uh, ET Let's Speak, when we started talking about this, they said, you know, you ought to find that. So I've I've asked the staff to go find it for me. Okay, I, I, Costa, Costa, did you did, have you heard this story before? Uh, yes, I have. I actually uh, read the story in Danny's uh, autobiography called uh, "The People's Advocate" that, that was just released. And okay, okay. It was, I was glued to it. Well, and I, I heard him also tell it. Yes, I I'm sitting here. I'm, I've I've never heard this story before. And not that I know everything, but this is uh, this is this is pretty this is pretty big stuff. And okay, so Daniel, yes. let's let me. Uh, I don't even know where to go with this. Let's back up for a second because I have a couple of questions. Sure. When you first saw the writing in the photograph, you know, mm -hmm. underneath uh, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the library, the symbol, yeah. uh, you said was it around the dome? So it was on the top of the craft? No, no, it, it, it's it's around the bottom of the dome. The dome sits on the saucer. Right. Uh, oh, I got you. Along the base of the dome. The base it, of the dome. Okay. Yeah, that's right where it was. And was the the base of the dome? So that was uh, metallic. Well. It looked metallic. Okay. It sure looked metallic. It was stuck in the side of the snowbank, and the and it it didn't it didn't seem to be damaged. Uh, it was because it seemed to be kind of mud like you know because it was winter, so it, it skidded all the way across the field and kind of stuck into the bank this big dirt embankment. Right. And it uh, it didn't seem to be damaged. Do, any no. idea of uh, uh, what what part of the country it was in? Obviously, I, I, in the I, north somewhere. No, I, I, I assume that it was somewhere in, where United States military bases are. The problem is they're everywhere. Right, right, right. But, but so I, I didn't know, but it was a, a northern, obviously a northern uh, place somewhere. 
I mean, it's conceivable it was south because they have snow way down the southern. Like, conceivable, land. right? But 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 I got the sense it was kind of a northern a place of some sort. I I didn't see any buildings around there or anything. It was just the no cars, the no license plates, nothing to indicate. No, they, okay, they just, all right. They were just all Air Force personnel around. I would have I would have found I would have would have noted those things. Now, how tall would you guess at the now? Uh, two questions about the yeah. these these symbols. Yeah. How tall were they, and were they engraved, or were they painted on? No, no, I, you... I, they they seemed they seemed to be engraved. Okay. In the in the along the base of the dome, and they and they were they were interesting. They they consisted of uh, they consisted of like uh, lines that were like a uh, a fort like you know for example a forty five degree line going from bottom to top, and then above it. Uh, at this 45 degree angle, there'd be like two dots, and then they'd have uh, a, another one that was uh, tipped in the other direction. They're going from the high end to the low end, from the left to right, and then there'd be a dot on the bottom of it and two small broken bars above the top of it. And then they'd have one that was like uh, a shape of like a U, like a little U, and it had two dots in the in the horseshoe opening, like in there. And they were like that, it, and it went all the way, uh, all this, this side of the dome that I could see had all these symbols, a whole long uh, row of them. Wow, wow. Now, yeah. um, and Costa, no typing, I, I, I'm going to so, tell you. So what, it wasn't anything, it wasn't anything <laughs> I'm not, I I'm not typing. No, it wasn't anything I'd Seriously? ever seen. It wasn't like hieroglyphics. It wasn't <laughs> uh, any kind of Oriental writing or Russian writing. It wasn't any kind of yeah, that writing. Yeah, nothing, nothing looked familiar to no. you. Wow. No, uh, so, wow. Uh, yeah, get that. I, I'd like to see it, and I certainly can put it into the right hands, and uh, yeah. we'll see if we can... Uh, if if we you know get some cross referencing done to see if there's anything else out there that's been seen like it out there, yeah, but that yeah, sure. I've never heard a, this story before, yeah. um, and it, wow, wow. That, that's why that's why you know later later in 1994 when I was uh, it was let's see we we would we had just gotten through doing the Iran Contra case we'd gone through this big huge. Uh, confrontation with the Reagan Bush administration, and I'd testified in front of Congress and the Foreign Affairs Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and and uh, we'd gotten the guys indicted, you know, that were doing the off-the-shelf enterprise. We went all the way through to the end of that thing uh, when they all folded and, and refused, you know, he pardoned them. You know, George H. W. Bush pardoned all the guys that got indicted by Lawrence Walls, and so I was I was out in California. I'd been asked to go out to the University of uh, of University of California in Santa Barbara, and teach a course, and I taught a course there called the Hidden History of America, the history of American covert operations, CIA covert operations from World War II to the present. So I had this gigantic class with like 350 kids in the class. They had to they had to broadcast the the course from the television studio on the campus uh, because they didn't have any room big enough to hold everybody, and uh, I was I was teaching that course. Uh, in Santa Barbara, and the the guy who was the art professor at Santa Barbara City College, uh, Ron. Uh, oh, it wasn't it wasn't uh, San, um, uh, UC Santa Barbara. It was Santa Barbara City College. Okay, no, gotcha. no, it was it was UC Santa Barbara where I was teaching. Okay, but the guy at Santa Barbara City College who was there, who he realized that I was in town because he knew about the Iran Contra case and all that kind of stuff. He called me up and asked me if I would come to his home because he wanted to talk to me about something. So I went to I went to his home and uh, Ron and Helen something or other. And the bottom line is uh, he asked me. He, we were having dinner. And he said to me, he said, "Look, do you mind if I ask you a personal question?" And I said, "No, go ahead." And he said, "What do you think about the issue of UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence?" And I said. Well, actually, I think it's one of the most important public policy questions uh, that there is. And he said, really? And he said, how come you've never said anything about it? And I said, well, nobody asked me. You know? And so he said, well, look, uh, my best friend, my best friend that I was in the Air Force with is Dr. John Mack, who is the head of the Department of Clinical Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And he has written this book called Abductions, 
human contact with uh, with extraterrestrial beings. He said, and uh, he's been dragged up in front of the faculty committee at Harvard University. And uh, you know, you graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Law School, and you know, you went to Harvard Divinity School. And uh, you know, would you be willing to take a call from him to consider representing him? And so I did. And John Matt called me and flew me out back to Boston, and I sat down and had meetings with him. And and then we prepared. We went to see uh, Lawrence Rockefeller. We went and met with Lawrence Rockefeller and ex- explained to him what was happening at Harvard. And Lawrence agreed to fund a what would amount to a grand rounds. That any any witnesses that we needed to bring in to verify uh, what it was John was writing about. Uh, John, John had 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 people sent to him as the head of the Department of Clinical Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, like you know a general officer in the United States Air Force who reported seeing a, uh, a UFO. For example, this one guy, I think his name was General Buell, I think his name was. Uh, he was the first, he was the first two-star uh, general in the United States Air Force after it converted from being the Army Air Force. Mm-hmm. And he was, he, was flying, he was flying a group of scientists uh, from Washington up to Greenland because they had, had a number of very unusual sightings of craft uh, doing extraordinarily fast turns and strange uh, maneuvers, and uh, they were concerned that this might be some kind of a new uh, aircraft that the Soviets had developed. So they were flying these group of scientists up, and, and General Buell uh, was, was, was piloting them. They had, they had two teams uh, of a pilot and co-pilot and navigator. They had two sets of them so they could alternate. And they were flying across the North Sea. He said, and I talked to the guy at length about it. He said, they were flying across the North Sea. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning, the pitch dark, and they're flying along. And he looks down, and he sees what looks like a, uh, like a circle of lights uh, down, way down on the ocean. And he, he said, this, this is bizarre. This almost looks like a little town down there. This can't be true. We're way away from any kind of land. He had his navigator rechecked. And he said, no, sure, we're way out over the North Atlantic. There's nothing here. And just as they were saying that, these, this, these lights came just flying up off the surface of the water and right in front of them, no, no more than, than 50 yards in front of them, was this huge UFO just sitting right there. And uh, he, was, he was afraid that he was going to hit it. So what he did is he pushed down on the, on the, uh, on the stick and went into a, an immediate nosedive to avoid running into it. And it just moved off to the left and sat there. And so he leveled the plane back out, and, and the, the co-pilot and the navigator were all excited, going, holy shit, look at that. Look at the size of that thing. Look at There's no doubt about what that is, right? He's telling <laughs> me this, right? And so he's concerned, saying that, well, look, you know, we've got a whole plane full of scientists out back here. That was a pretty steep dive. I'd better go back and check on them. So he has the, he has the, the co-pilot take over the stick, and he gets up, and he goes back into the passenger cabin, and all the scientists are all over on one side of the plane looking out the window at this thing, right? Except for one guy. And there's one guy standing in the aisle with his back turned off them, with his arms folded. And, uh, and, and, and General Buell went up to him and he said, look, he said, uh, uh, are you all right? The guy said, yes, yes, I'm fine. He said, do you see what's out there? And the guy turned to him and said, I'm a scientist. I don't believe in those things. I'm not looking. <laughs> And so he, he, filed, he filed a full report about this, right? And so he is asked by the United States Air Force to go and get a, a mental test. So he, get, he gets sent to Harvard Medical School, and the head of the Department of Clinical Psychiatry, John Mack, you know, goes through this examination of him and finds out that he's basically normal. And then he had a number of other people sent to him over time. Uh, did, so, you know, did you know John Mack when you went to Harvard? Was... No, 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 not at all. Didn't know him at all because he was over at the medical school. You know, I, I had been at the, at the college, uh, graduated in 67. Then I went to the law school and graduated in 70. And then I was out practicing law for three years, went to the KO firm on Wall Street and did the Pentagon Papers case and, you know, those other cases established the right of journalists to protect their confidentiality and news sources. Then I went to F. Lee Bailey's office. I was one of the three defense counsel in Lee Bailey's office when we did the Watergate burglary case and represented James McCord, who blew the whistle on Nixon and blew the whistle on the plumber's unit and got Nixon to have to resign. Now, how, was, how, how, uh, uh, Daniel, how yeah. did you manage to be at the center of so many 
storms. I mean, and not only that, but it takes a certain amount of backbone to do what you what you did um, in in Washington, and it it takes a strong strong person because you're up against the man, literally uh, sure. against the man. Um, you know your character. I, I just, <laughs> I, and I'm not making light of it, but you have to be a really strong person. And and not only that, but you went back for seconds and thirds. Oh yeah, well, that's uh, and right. some of the biggest cases in history. Um, yeah. uh, Costa and I were talking about this earlier, but you know you you, uh, well you had some help, but you took down a sitting president. You know practically. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, yeah, and, so, and and we kept George Bush, George H. W. Bush, from winning a second term. You know, we I did I did the depositions of his his private secretary, uh, and then took the deposition of his national security advisor, Donald P. Gregg, and extracted from them the speak the talking memos from the meetings in which George Bush and Donald Gregg, his national security advisor, vice presidential national security advisor, were meeting face to face with Felix Rodriguez who was the guy who was running the Ilopango airlift operation. Right, right. Smuggling, uh, smuggling illegal weapons to the Contras in complete defiance of the Boland Amendment that had been passed by Congress. And so, the, you know, the, I, just, I just learned, you see, I was, I was the, my father was the very first Sheehan man in our Sheehan family ever to graduate from high school. And my, my brother didn't graduate from high school. My sister didn't graduate from high school. I was fortunate. I ended up getting a full, complete scholarship to Harvard College and then a full scholarship to Harvard, Harvard Law School. And uh, I, got, I got recruited by the number one uh, Wall Street litigation law firm, Cahill Gordon, because, and I was found, the founder of the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review. And so I went down there and got to go to Lee Bailey's office. I was at the number one places in the country, and I didn't – it was funny. I didn't have any big, huge investment in this. The, you know, the, I came from nothing, had nothing. The, the worst that could happen is they would what? Fire you. You know, if you <laughs> if you insisted upon doing cases like this, and I didn't I didn't have that position to start with. So I didn't uh, I didn't worry about that. And it's been the way I've done it for 45 years. And uh, if and the the fact of the matter is that the reason that a lot of these kind of cases don't get done. Is just because nobody quite dares to do them. It, that's exactly my point. And yeah. also, I mean, is it is it a, a certain amount of luck too as well that you know you happen to be at the right place at the right time and everything just aligns and and you're the guy there. Well, I, I know actually what it is is you have to recognize it when it comes. Right. And a lot of people don't recognize it. They can't they can't see the full implications. But for for example, how, how this happened when when I was. Well, I was at Harvard Law School, and I was asked to write for the Harvard Law Review, right? Because I, in, in a long story, it's in the book. But uh, and they said, look, we'd like to have you write an article uh, on how to set up a foreign subsidiary of an American corporation in a foreign country. And so I said to the editor, I said, I don't want to, I don't have, the, I don't have the slightest interest in setting up a foreign subsidiary of an American corporation in a foreign country. I don't want to do that. I want to do civil rights cases and human rights cases. They said, well, you know, we only have those once in a rare time when the Supreme Court decides a big constitutional law case, you know, so there, there isn't really an adequate amount of time for that. They said, but look, uh, the, Mark Green, one of your classmates, said the same thing, who was asked to write for the review. Why don't you two guys get together and see what you can do? So we got together, and we started the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review. We put the whole thing together, and... And Mark was going to handle the notes and the regular law review articles. And I said I wanted the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review to be kind of a practical journal to, to teach young lawyers how to do civil rights cases. And so what now, I did and I, this was – so you graduated in 67, so I'm yeah, guessing this, this is 65? Yeah, this is 1968 now. Okay, gotcha. law school. Okay. Uh, so I, was, I graduated from Harvard College in 67, got nominated for the Rhodes Scholarship, but then I got drafted by my draft board. I had a big war with them because uh, I'd already spent two years in the Special Forces, and I didn't intend to go. And so they reclassified me 1A, and, uh, and they wouldn't let me go take the roads. They, I wasn't allowed to leave the country for more than six months without my board giving me permission, and they wouldn't do it. So I took the scholarship to go up to Harvard Law School and went up there. And uh, so I came in in the fall of 67. You know, and there I was in that halcyon year of 1968, 
you know, and here's two of my professors, Abe Shea and uh, Adam Yarmolinsky, who were both uh, advisors to Bobby Kennedy. And we were trying to persuade Bobby to run against Lyndon Johnson, you know, to, because of the war thing. And uh, Bobby wouldn't do it. And then uh, so Joe Grandmaison and uh, Gary Hart, we sent them out to try to find someone. And they, they went and got Gene McCarthy. Did you say run. Gary Hart? Yeah. The yeah, Gary, Gary Hart? Yeah, Gary Hart, yeah. Okay. And, and Joe Grandmaison. There were two guys that we got to go, to go talk to uh, Gene McCarthy, the, the senator from, uh, from Minnesota. Or, and so, they, so Wisconsin. They, they went there and got him to run against Johnson. And it turns out in January of 1968, the very first primary campaign for the Democratic Party, Gene McCarthy almost beat Lyndon Johnson. Yes, he did. And so Lyndon Johnson came on television and said, uh, I will not accept, uh, you know, and I'm not going to ask for it. I will not accept your nomination as president. And he, was, he withdrew from the Democratic uh, primary. And so Bobby Kennedy comes in. So I was right there in that starting January of 1968, of my first year of law school, working with Abe Shea, who was going to be the Secretary of State for Bobby, and Adam Yarmolinsky, who was going to be his Secretary of Defense, who were two of my professors, we were working on foreign policy and domestic policy for Bobby Kennedy, and uh, when uh, he was shot and killed, you know, and so in, in that that uh, April, uh, in April, Martin Luther King was shot and killed down in Tennessee, and then on the night of our very first final at Harvard Law School on June 5th of 1968, uh, Bobby is killed, shot that morning, you know, and. So everything was was uh, extraordinarily disrupted during our, you know, my freshman year, my freshman year, John Kennedy is killed, you know, and then my first year of law school, you know, Bobby is killed and Martin Luther King is killed. I mean, things were just knocked into a complete top hat. Uh, and, and then, you know, Hubert Humphrey ends up getting the nomination at, in Chicago, you know. 20 scrillion kids all go to Chicago and, and surround the cow palace and start chanting, and the police go ape and attack them all. Right. You know, that was that year. That was 1968. That was my first year of law school. So it wasn't, you know, but I, I wasn't in Chicago because I was actually, uh, I put it back into the second edition of the book. I was actually organizing a thing called the Biafra Relief Commission, and I, we got these uh, 12 DC-7s from Freddie Laker, and uh, gathered up all the food from the civil defense bomb shelters in the United States and flew the food into Biafra to break the blockade uh, in the, the Biafran province of Nigeria. Yep. I was doing that all that summer. And uh, it was just, it was just we, we had a sense during that time that, that you had an absolute obligation to just do everything you could from whatever position you found yourself in and I was fortunate to be, you know, at Harvard College. I had Henry Kissinger for foreign policy and, you know, Ken Galbraith for economics. And, and uh, you know, I had all these, these people that everybody's all heard about, you know, as my professors. So it gave me uh, entree onto doing things that other people couldn't do. What was, um, was F. Lee Bailey, and I, I want to back up yeah. a little bit, yeah, but yeah. I just, since you worked for him directly, yeah. Yeah. W- was he all that? Was he really smart, or was he more logical? I mean, what? Well, no. He, he, uh, Lee, Lee, Lee was very smart. He's a smart guy. You know, he had he had uh, he had spent his first year in college at Harvard College, but then he withdrew and joined the Marine Corps in the in the Korean War, and then came back and went to BU instead of coming back to Harvard. But uh, he's a smart guy. But what what he what he did is he had private investigators. That's the key to Lee. Lee had a stable of 40 private investigators uh, and the Class A licensed private investigators, gun toters, you know, that would go and investigate the heck out of everything. So he knew everything uh, uh, about the case. And so when you know what the facts are of the case, you know, you can come off <laughs> right. looking terrific. Right. Remember all the, all the Perry Mason shows, it's always the, his investigator that goes out and finds the last dramatic witness and brings them in at the last minute and puts them on the stand. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it doesn't require a legal genius. Uh, in, in the same way, for example, that Jerry Spence. Jerry Spence, who's the best criminal defense lawyer and the best plaintiff's lawyer in, alive, actually, you know, uh, is a brilliant guy. But he just, he, he has just this uncanny uh, sense of how to cross-examine people and, and dig out of them what they're hiding. 
you know. And so Jerry, Jerry has those particular skill sets, which are unsurpassed. Lee has the best investigators in the world. And what Lee wanted, Lee wanted me to come and be like a desk jockey for him, to write right out of law school, to write legal briefs and file motions to suppress and do all that kind of stuff. And I told him I wouldn't do that. I, I was going to do trials. And so I went down to Cahill and got to do trials right off the bat. So I did trials for three years and then ended up getting, uh, leaving Bailey's office after we discovered during the Watergate break-in case, you know, why it was they were really breaking in there and how it was connected to the assassination of President Kennedy. You know, we, we discovered what had happened there. And I said, uh-oh, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And so I stepped out of there and quit and went over to Harvard Divinity School and uh, wow. took, uh, did the master's program uh, in comparative social ethics and then rolled it over into the Ph.D. program. And that's where I was when I got recruited to become chief counsel for the Jesuit order in the United States down in Washington. And, and Costa, you're going to have to uh, – that's your opening act, man. I don't know how you're going <laughs> to <laughs> – wow. I, uh, but, uh, <laughs> I, I am thrilled that Mr. Sheehan Daniel is such an opening act. Is, I'm still sitting pulling my jaw up off the floor, and I've heard this before yeah, as well. I read about it, and oh, it's still – blows my mind uh one i I just i have to read this tweet that just popped up it said jimmy is flustered and speechless for the first time (laughs) (laughs) take a picture Uh, uh, yeah right right (laughs) well they they can all read it you know that i was i was surprised some people approached me counterpoint press and asked me to write a book you know so i said you know i've been so busy i've never people keep saying holy mackerel you should write a book about this and so i said i never had time and so they they asked me to write the book so i started now with computers where you can store it all, I, I was kind of, you know, on airplanes writing and in bus depots and in the back of courtrooms, I was kind of writing along in this book. And uh, so I've written this book called The People's Advocate. Uh, people can get it now. That it's, a, it's right at the, my website at danielpsheehan.com. Yeah, we've got all uh, the links can, up, Daniel. We've can got punch a button and right. order the book. And it tells about all this stuff. And uh, I'm going to be writing three books, actually. There's a, the second book I'm writing right now, which is called Rulers of the Realm. Uh, and then there's going to be the third book, which is called uh, The History of America's Future. What, um, uh, with, we were, uh, Costa and I were talking about this earlier, so uh, uh, it's kind of a, a, a direct question, but... Uh, you've you've definitely set the stage here, but what is it that you feel? Or actually, no, I'm going to point this to to Costa. Costa, what is it that uh, that uh, Daniel is bringing to the organization besides a whole lot of street cred? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, true about the street cred and a first rate intellect and and a great big heart for this. What he's bringing to us. Um, uh, we're etletstalk.org right now, and we're transitioning to uh, ufocontact.com for a number of reasons. One of the major ones is in with that platform at ufocontact.com, uh, Danny and other top flight researchers in the UFO field will have a platform to speak about um, extraterrestrial intelligence, both from their personal experience as well as from uh, as well as talk about the philosophical, social, political, theological implications uh, in any way that that they they deem is necessary, that, that they want to get the word out. Uh, and they'll have this place uh, through our platform to do that. So uh, Danny right now is um, is serving just a wonderful purpose of bringing his experience and his... Um, his deep knowledge about this topic. Um, I mean, he wanted to be an astronaut. When when someone starts out uh, that way, uh, you know that they've got some kind of a connection with something larger, you know, the, the universe, and wanting to understand what it's about and wanting to to communicate with, with um, other civilizations out there. And since at etletstalk.org, we're about communicating and teaching people how to do that, uh, Danny's life, and how it started with the, the love of space and astronauts and astronautics rather and and such just fits right in to where many of us are and in a public way he will bring that 
he, he does bring credibility, and, and we welcome that. Um, and we just uh, want to give him an opportunity to to talk about, for example, his worldviews. And, and rather than me go into the detail on that, the, there's, he has a very well-developed uh, philosophical framework of, of how uh, people or where people operate from in, in, in their personal worldview, which projects out into who they then are in society. And, of course, when they're people of influence and power, who they are, how they filter things, and how they see the world affects a whole lot of other people. <laughs> and Danny speaks right. very eloquently to that and has a framework from which he discusses that. And uh, what I will say is that in his eighth worldview of this framework, he brings in the uh, the most powerful aspect in my mind, which is contact with galactic civilizations. And that's where we find Danny right now. He has had um, an uh a career second to none um, in Washington and doing all the, the wonderful things he's just been talking about. But at this stage where we see that he wants to talk about extraterrestrial intelligence and the implications in, in so many areas of what contact with them means, well, then he segues right into, he intersects right to where we're going. We're congruent and we're going to be working together. Part of this journey is to figure out uh, what it is we're going to do. I mean, we are teaching people how to make contact, and Danny will educate them and and offer his own, uh, whatever it is he, he, he wants to bring to this, to, to develop. He'll well, have the platform, and we'll, do, we'll be there with him. So what is, uh, what is ET Let's Talk? Let's, let's start there. Um, uh, we have a, a large core of listeners that may not have heard about ET Let's Talk. So uh, while you're doing that, I want everybody to go to jimmychurchradio.com. Go to the homepage. Everybody knows where we keep the galleries. Scroll down, and below my church rant from the show opener is a, is a really quick small gallery tonight um and there's three pictures there it says daniel sheehan and, and costa mccrease et let's talk in the middle is a map and so while while you are telling us about et let's talk and and what you're what you're doing um i want everybody to look at this map and uh, uh and so they will understand uh, as you start to lay everything out. So let's start with that foundation. Okay. Let's go there. Okay. Yeah, that's well put. Um, ETLetstalk.org is a social community. and We all know what that kind of thing is like. Uh, they're all over the place on the net. What makes us different is that we built it to be a safe and secure community where people who have had um, experiences or beliefs or whatever uh, along the ET, the ET, the extraterrestrial intelligence uh, in that area, can safely come and talk about it with each other. Um, and we have, um, to date, uh, after, well, let me back up a little bit. We launched in November of 2012, and to date we have almost 5,000 members worldwide in more than 50 countries. Now, by the, by the um, measurement of uh, social communities like Facebook, which has you know tens and hundreds of millions of users, we're not, we're not that big, but we're just very new and we're growing. Um, so it's a safe place where people can, can come and go on forums, find each other, and the the map that you mentioned is actually the place where uh, for the members who are are paid members, on, and it's a very very low fee that that supports us to keep doing this. For those members, um, they can go to that community map and drill down into it and find teams or individuals that are nearby to them geographically or even as on other parts of the world if they want, get the email addresses of those people and link with them. And that's a very powerful thing because what I have discovered in the, the few years that I've, I've worked in building communities, a uh, community like this, is that people are so... Um, happy to find that there is someone else to talk to. They've been, let's say, rejected by a, a spouse or their family doesn't want to hear about it uh, or they're afraid uh, because their religion has made them that way. I mean, there's a, a lot of reasons why people don't come out and talk and then they hide uh, their belief or their experiences with seeing UFOs 
and interacting with an extraterrestrial intelligence. So I've heard this all the time. And through this map and through this community, they can find other like-minded individuals where they can start kind of coming out, uh, talking, sharing information, comparing, um, learning from each other, inspiring each other, and actually connecting. Uh, in the community there, we, we have someone with a click of a mouse can talk to someone on the other side of the world, and they may have nothing else in common, but they can talk about an experience they had, for example, as a child, where they saw a, a craft at treetop level, um, and they could never talk about it until now. And so this is very profound and very powerful for people, and that's why they're, they're flocking to the community. Um, as we uh, segue etletstalk.org uh, to come under the umbrella of ufocontact.com, which is um, under construction right now and which will launch um, April 22nd, uh, we will also be offering a mobile app, uh, this is the social era, that will uh, run right. on iPhone and Android uh, devices, phones, that will also feature the map. You'll be able to join from uh, the downloaded app and in your hand, literally be able to find people by looking at that map and connect with them while you're standing there and chat with them. I, as soon as you find them anywhere in the world and say, I, I hear you're interested in ET, let's talk. Right. Let's talk with ET and let's talk with each other. Um, that's what we're building. I, I, I got uh, uh, from... Uh, uh, some some of your support staff had emailed uh, our team here. We just didn't get it up in time for the show. We might be able to get it up before the end of the show. Uh, my producers here uh, we should start working on it because I'm talking about it and they are listening. <laughs> but in that in that group of pictures was uh, a shot of the iPhone app. And this is, and, and I thought it was first off very, very slickly laid out and simple. Uh, and uh, but there was instructions there on communication, and I want to touch upon that. Well, I don't want to touch upon it. I want to really talk about it. I, I, I had read uh, through your stuff this week on how to do it. Very intriguing. I, you know, I've had uh, Dr. Greer on the show. I've followed all of his stuff over the years. And uh, so I want to, and I know that, when did you first meet Dr. Greer? That's uh, just a quick question. How long ago? Oh, uh, that was in September, I believe, of 2006. How has things changed as far as communication go between 2006 and now? Or is it still the same basic fundamentals? Just a quick answer, because we're going to go through actually what you do uh, in, in a few minutes. But the fundamental is consciousness and the use of consciousness um, and uh, intention and coherent thought in making contact, and that's the core. And ha so it hasn't changed. Those those fundamentals are still uh, how you get it, it done. Uh, maybe other people could debate that, but from what I've seen and what we practice and teach that hasn't changed other people will customize and they do that in our network all the time right but we do teach those fundamentals of uh, of consciousness which involve you know visualization um uh, intention heart-centered uh, approaches uh to, to communication is it that it, will remain the same is it uh generally um uh, do you have to be in a specific geographic location or can it be in an urban center like downtown Los Angeles and Chicago yeah. or, or do you have to, you know, head out to the desert or to the country or something more open? I, I'm, it, it can be, no, it can be anywhere. Um, uh, we've received reports by the hundreds from our, um, the people in our network that, uh, they've done it. The contact from hotel rooms, uh, like you said, urban areas, suburban areas, remote areas, it, it doesn't matter. What is important to recognize, though, is that the kind of contact that comes, it, it, it comes in a variety of ways, and you have to be open to, to uh, recognizing what those are. For example, if you're in a remote area and you use um, uh, this, uh, what we call our hu human-initiated uh, contact uh, experience, 
um, methods, which are on our website, you use them, say, in a remote area, it might be easier, and I'm just speculating for an extraterrestrial civilization, to show themselves in the sky, maybe make a close approach, right. rather than doing it in downtown L.A. Now, having said that, YouTube is full of videos where people have been in Manhattan and seen, you know, a formation of objects flying over and filmed them. So it's, I, I can set down certain rules, but then it's not hard to find where some of those rules are broken as to where this contact can occur. Um, now, having said that, visual contact, as exciting as that is, and it still excites me even after all these years, and, and, and it happens over and over for me, um, there are other methods. Uh, ET intelligence will use whatever method is safe in the situation for them and for you or for you and your group uh, to do the communication. And that type of communication can involve um, uh, contacting you via telepathy, uh, lucid dreams. Uh, sometimes people will get a touch on the shoulder or a cheek or a knee. Um, people will also uh, have weird electrical phenomenon happen around them, like uh, I've had a smartphone literally turn itself on and, 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 and start playing a song that was appropriate to the conversation I was just having about E.T. with someone. Right. Um, stuff like that also happens. Uh, E.T. intelligence is, is very creative in, in how they can go about and make this communication. So it's up to us to um, expand our minds and, and look for the less obvious lights in the sky thing, as thrilling as those are, because once we expand our mind and expand the, uh, the parameters there, then we find that uh, the contact uh, does come more in volume because you're just you're you're looking for it. And and let me say though that we always have to um, try to filter out what might be a natural explanation, whether you're looking for something in the sky, or it happens closer in your environment or to yourself. Uh, we don't blindly accept everything. I, I tell people use your discerning mind. Um, ask yourself first, what well, could it have been? This 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 or this. Go down a list, and only when you really feel. Um, satisfied that you've eliminated all the normal types of things that could have produced whatever reaction you just got in the sky or nearby or, or on your body right. or in your dream or whatever. And maybe you have witnesses and you might ask someone nearby, would you validate this? Did you see the same thing? Compare notes. So you drill down through what it could not be. And then finally, when you're left with nothing other than to think, well, what's left is ET intelligence. Let's work with that. Let's go with that now. Uh, then that's really the way to to, to, to proceed. Um, what our people are, this is not a really scientific experience in terms of we're not doing this in a lab and controlling all the variables and tweaking this and that. Uh, we wish we could, but the laboratory really is the whole world. It's the sky. It's, um, it's your hotel room, your living room. What we are able to do, though, that we find is uh, people can repeat their experiences by using these heists, these human um, um, initiated contact experience um, uh, methods, they can repeat the contact, and it may come a different way a second time, but it's really power in your own hands, power with your own consciousness to, to do this uh, wherever it is you find yourself. Do whatever you have, time of day, it doesn't matter. Do, do you have uh, in the organization, and let's talk, uh, do you have like a Michael Jordan contact guy? I mean, one guy that, or 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 she, <laughs> you know that 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 just really, you know, gets it done uh, consistently. I would say I. It's not a person, but we have groups because we do. Um, you understand uh, the question. Um, <laughs> you, you're asking, do we have a superstar, somebody who's always the go-to person when no one else is making contact? <laughs> yeah, Throw the yeah. Ball to Michael Jordan and he just like, dunks the soccer. Right? I, I, I think you understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can't single anybody out like that. Um, I will say that from the reports I get, um, there are certain groups that have so well developed this over time that they consistently get dramatic sightings. I have a group in Albany, New York that has had uh, flyovers low, I think a thousand feet or less uh, of a disc with lights that people could take pictures of more than once happened to them. And they're a group of, I believe, two dozen, maybe three dozen people that have been meeting monthly for a few years. 
uh, that's a super group right there. There may not be a Michael Jordan, but it's a group. They, they're producing these repeatable results. There are others like them, uh, one in Australia that I'm thinking of. And in fact, this month, they're gathering at least 60 people to have a group experience and, and do these, um, these uh, heist methods to, to make contact. And that's repeated also with other groups um, around the world. Um, I do want to say that what we sponsor at etletstalk.org, uh, right, and we've been doing this since, um, actually I started in October of 2010, but once we founded, uh, I co-founded um, etletstalk.org, uh, I continued this monthly contact thing. I urge all our teams to, um, to use a 24-hour period, we have a certain schedule every month around the new moon when it's uh, a darker sky, and we all go out during that 24-hour period. We often get about 200 teams in 30 countries that just focus on that period, and we uh, kind of link up with each other in our visualization, our meditation, uh, to make ET contact, and then we send reports back, uh, and I print them on the, or they're written on the website in the forums there of what people have encountered um, and the um, the experiences are so individual they are inspiring they... that you, you always learn something it's like oh uh, you don't you can't say I've seen everything because you haven't something's going to surprise you as people do this every month um, and yeah I, I spent and some time to... there I spent some time there uh, when uh, Renee had at first pointed me in your guys' direction and, and I went over and checked it out quite a bit, did a lot of reading and you're absolutely right. Uh, it's very unique and it's never, or each, it, 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 it's, it's almost not scientific in that it's not repeatable. <laughs> Everybody's experience is, 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 is just a little bit different. It's very interesting and it's also very global. And uh, oh oh, really quick before I uh, we get too far away from this, um, I need you to tell me about this photograph that you took of uh, this ET, this being, and I think everybody uh, now every just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, go down to the gallery, go down to Costa's gallery, and uh, click on the picture on the right. And uh, how do you pronounce the name of this? I pronounced it Hirate. Hirate. I'm not sure how it is. I um, th that was given by a, a member who um, had some more knowledge about that uh, in that picture, and I won't I won't go more into that. But but that's not the important part. The the important part is that picture. Yes, it, because uh, I, I want to uh, let me get. Can I can I enter? Uh, I'm going to jump in um, and just say that. Uh, uh, I, it's one of the most extraordinary pictures I've, I've, I've ever seen. We, we are all familiar with what we, we get in the media and, and, you know, it's all over the internet. This, I don't know quite what I'm looking at and I need everybody to go to jimmychurchradio.com right now. Scroll down to Costas's uh, gallery and there's three pictures there. This is the third picture all the way on the right open it up it's very large and when when you told me that this was an et and i opened it up and looked i i didn't even talk to you about it i didn't <laughs> I, I, because I, I wanted to save it for time i don't know it's extraordinary i don't know what i am looking at and and but now that i know that it's an et it almost makes sense am i making i don't want to sound like i'm nuts okay that's why i want everybody to look at this picture so you can understand what we are looking at now please costas what is this let me give you did i say costas background. instead of costa i'm i'm sorry my my fa okay. my father's name is costas and, and, and so uh, no a, not a problem okay costa, so. costas um <laughs> We were in a group meditation, and um, there was a, a camera in the middle of that that uh, was pointed at uh, myself and my wife, um, and a group of about 40 people, and it was very dark, lights out, uh, so there were no other sources of light. And that particular being appeared between behind myself and my wife. Uh, we didn't see it with the naked eye, but when walking to the middle of the circle where 
that this group had formed and this camera was on the, the tripod, when you stood and looked through the, um, the, the viewfinder of the camera, you could see what, what's being uh, displayed there um, in that position, stationary. Um, and then when I, I or other people took their eye away from the viewfinder, there was nothing there in that spot. So that was a really weird experience. You know, I look over here, I can see that, oh my God, that's dramatic. Then you look away with your naked eye into that same area and it's just pitch black. So that picture is what the camera picked up. It was a digital camera. I don't know the specifics, the make, the model, the resolution, etc. But I was later told by um, a friend in our network that um, that particular uh, being had shown up deliberately um, as proof that, that, that it can be done and that people can see with their own eyes. Now, when you look at it, um, what I've seen is kind of a collar and a vest. Yep. You know, uh, I have a creative imagination. I have to check myself sometimes. It's like, you know, when you're a kid, a kid and you look at clouds, like I used to be one of those kids, that I could make a face out of clouds. I would see stuff. That's like the old right brain operating there. Great if you're an artist. So I was using that faculty as I looked at that particular picture and just doing a reality check with other people, you know, saying, does that look like a collar to you? Does that look like it's wearing a vest or part of a torso? And they would look at it and scrunch their face and, you know, scrunch their face up and kind of look at it and go, yeah, yeah, I see that now. And this looks like could be the head on top of that, but it's not completely lit up. It's almost like there's the blackness uh, only gives you a partial view as if something was occluded or or a shadow fell over it, so that you don't see the fully formed figure that might look like it's humanoid. You just see enough of it that this um, is what I this is what I see. And um, his head is tilted, so if you lean your head to the right, okay, and you kind of tilt your head, then and squint your eyes a little bit. Now you can see the two eye sockets, and you can see his chin. Uh, is in the center now. It's very, very symmetrical. If you, if you, if if you look at it and you're assuming that it's straight, no, the the head. I, this is what I think. The head is tilted and almost looking over his shoulder, like he's turning around and looking at you. That's mm -hmm. what I see now. But but what's what's fooling you here is the because of the way that we. Uh, I looked at this picture for a while today, Kyle. I, I got to tell you, it's a, it's, a, it's, mm -hmm. it's astounding. But we perceive that as the front of a jacket. Okay, mm -hmm. so you think you're looking at the front. I think you're kind of looking at the side or the back, and then he's looking over his shoulder, and his head is turning around and tilted, looking at you. Okay, and that's why I see the two eyes. You see how the head is kind of tilted. Yeah, and then there's like almost a, a, a ten a on on his head, some kind of helmet, and but you can see the ear, so that's that's what I that's the way I kind of perceive, and possibly smoking a cigarette, by the way, <laughs> or an alleged cigarette. Yeah, you know, yeah. We don't, know. We, we don't know what they smoke. Maybe but, that's how they right, how right. They travel across interstellar. I'm just joking about that. Well, but. Be, well, when I first when I first saw the picture, and everybody, if you aren't looking at this right now, you're really missing out because this is a it's a crazy shot, crazy, crazy. But you can clearly see an arm, and if you see how the appendage is on the arm on the right, um, I'm guessing we're looking at his back because of the way the, the arm is bent and he's like walking away and then turning around and looking back over his shoulder. That's what I see. And I don't know if anybody's ever described it to you like that, but you know, you are the first Jimmy that has, um, uh, so fully developed what it is you see and who am I to say you're wrong? I mean, clearly there's something there. And, right. And, Five different people will see maybe a core of the same thing, but have a slightly twisted interpretation of it. Right, yours, right. Yours is literally a little bit twisted. He's turning away. I, never saw <laughs> it. I thought it was full. I thought it was 
mostly full frontal, but I'm going to be looking at it again now afterwards. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm thinking it's a twisted neck, and he's looking over his shoulder back at the camera, and the head is tilted to the right, and you're looking at a partial side view. So that's what, that's what I think. Because then when you look at it sideways, then the symmetrical part of the skull starts to form. You can see the eye sockets. You can see the cheek. You can see the nose. You can see the chin. You can see his ear. And it all makes sense. Yeah. If you if you look at it this way and you kind of come back and you're just trying to – no, it's just uh, – it's a, it's a freakish, really cool picture. But if you, if you look at it the other way – you can start to see some skeletal, skeletal uh, sense. That's well, just and here, you know. here's the really cool thing. I mean, that's one incident of something that was captured um, in our uh, et let's talk dot org community. Uh, people have taken other videos and pictures, uh, and sometimes of of objects, um, of of orbs, things that are just as maybe not just as dramatic as that one up close but maybe dramatic in another way uh i am always amazed at what people come up with and that's why i say this is one example and the, the people in our network you never know what they're what they're going to capture hey uh, uh, dan just, daniel are you there yes i'm right here uh, what do you what do you what do you what do you see when you see this uh et i don't i i'm just sitting here in my living room on monterey bay Rubbing my uh, dog's ear, listening. Oh, so oh, I don't have I don't have the uh, I don't have the, the uh, internet up. He's living the good life in Monterey life. Bay. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, having to prepare tonight a major lecture I'm giving at the Divinity School and Law School at Boston University in the, the first week of April on the spirituality, uh, social ethics, and the practice of constitutional law in the 21st century. Uh, I've got to do that later tonight, so I'm just sitting here relaxing <laughs> and having a good conversation. Today. Yeah, thank you, thank you. This 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 picture is a uh, is pretty creepy. It in in a in a in a it doesn't make sense sort of way. You know, because we are used to when uh, you know Daniel's sitting there with his dog. You look at you look down at your dog. You know it's a dog because you know what you're looking at, or you look at a car. You know what you're looking at. And you go and you look at this picture, Costa, and it it it, it the, our brain doesn't know how to uh, compute right. what it's looking at because it is also oh I meant to tell you this, um, and I don't know if you're looking at the picture, but I almost see a spine, so that's why I think I'm looking at the back. That looks like vertebrae going right down next to what looks like it's the jacket opening. That looks like mm -hmm. vertebrae, and that looks like it goes right down to a tail, and that's that's how my funky brain works. But that's what I think I'm looking at. I think you're looking at something walking away or standing with its back to you, and it's turning around and and looking right at the camera. It's interesting because it, it reminds me of a story that when uh, John Mack got called by Robert Bigelow, the guy that owns Bigelow Aerospace, and, right? Uh, he owns, I guess, the budget inns or something uh he had purchased a piece of land down at the four corners down in in colorado and uh there was a uh a what do you call it like a, a vortex or a uh, uh uh a native american sacred spot on that land very famous uh, spot and he ended up purchasing the land because he has all this money right and he sent some of his people there with a uh, with a set of cameras and equipment and recorders and computers and whole nine yards to try to it was a it was a portal like place and uh, they staked it out for a long time and I talked to the guy this guy this Irish professor who was there manning the site of time when all of a sudden this portal started to open and he could look through into like this other dimension. And that there was this being there. It sounds as if he was like looking at uh, the professor, like over his shoulder, kind of like he'd been kind of taken off guard. That uh, that, that all of a sudden this portal opened, and this, this Irish professor was completely terrified because uh, he could tell that it wasn't. It was in some completely different place, and the the being turned around and kind of looked at him. Uh, and uh, reached out his hand, and then the portal closed. 
And so the, the professor, I can tell you, I, I've interviewed a lot of people, and I was interviewing this guy, and he was absolutely, totally sincere because he was terrified even when he was telling the story again. And what happened is he contacted uh, Bigelow, Robert Bigelow, and Bigelow sent uh, uh, some additional team members in with more equipment, and they arrived at the place, and this big classic black helicopter flew in, and uh, these armed guys in black uniforms, no no military insignia, no police insignia or anything, uh, got off, Caucasian American guys, paramilitary type guys, got out of the helicopter and told them they had to leave. And they announced to them, that, and, and, and Robert Bigelow standing right there when the guy's telling me the story, and John Mack is there, we're, we're sitting right there together out in, I guess it was in Nevada, I guess we were. And, uh, and uh, he said the people, the, these military types told them they had to leave. And the Irish professor said, you know, that, that our, our principal, uh, Mr. Bigelow, owns this place. And they said they didn't care, and that they started, the military people are smashing their equipment. They're smashing their equipment and actually pushing the guys around, knocking them down, and terrified them. And they got up, and these, these guys all took off, and they went back to this cabin that's on the, uh, the far end of the, the property. Uh, it's like a ranch area. And uh, all night long, there was this horrendous weird thing was going on like as if the way he put it was almost like their building was being uh kind of uh, attacked with kind of some kind of psychotronic uh, uh technology of some sort it was causing the whole building to kind of shake and and made them ill and it was some kind of vibrational uh technology was being directed at them and they got up the next morning and all fled and uh and Robert Bigelow uh, withdrew. He was really terrified, and he said he didn't want to do this stuff anymore. And he he actually stopped talking about the fact that he was going to put up this you know motel up in orbit and all that kind of stuff. And this gee, this was like 1990. Let's see when this was. This must have been 95, 96, or something like that. He did this like for 10 years. He just withdrew and didn't want to talk about this anymore. He was so intimidated by what had happened. Because uh, I was going to do a lawsuit against them, you know, I'd say, "Here, we'll kick their butt for doing this," and uh, <clears throat> he just didn't want to do it. And uh, so it's just been very recently that he's now come back out and started to talk about the fact that he is planning to, I think, put up some private uh, 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 satellites and some and, and get back to trying to put a motel like up into space. You know, people will. Oh, he's start, certainly will, he's he has yeah. certainly got a pretty major. Yeah. Uh, uh, installation and factory right. and production all yeah. in the works and yeah. So, but so he's come back. Yes. Uh, but there was this big long hiatus where he was so intimidated by this. But it, it sounds very similar. I mean, the, the right, the, right, what it the does. I saw what this Irish professor saw through this portal. It was something very peculiar. He couldn't quite. It, it, there was just something so completely strange and different about it. Uh, he knew perfectly well that it was some other dimension. That it was. It was it was not it was not ex, it was not exactly human, uh, but it was humanoid. Uh, but he, he couldn't he and you could tell he was just so frightened by this thing. Uh, but that that was my experience with that. I've got uh, I've got a, a a question from Renee in Tucson. This is for Costa. It's a little bit lengthy, but uh, let's uh, let's get it done I'll, uh, because there's a few good points in here. So. Uh, but Costa, this is for you. And then okay. I've, I've got another one right after this for uh, for Daniel. Um, but anyway, uh, many contactees have said that we need to concentrate more on messages that ETs are sending us, such as stop fighting, learn to get along with each other, and stop destroying the planet. Seven of the Ten Commandments given to Moses by the voice, uh, was that an ET, behind the burning bush, had to do with how to treat others. Maybe that was the last time we paid attention to the actual message <laughs> and not just the miracle around it. By the time of the visitations of at Fatima 100 years ago, three kids saw and heard a beautiful light emanating female entity warn them about the terrible coming of war mm -hmm. and people didn't change their ways. But most of many witnesses took from that uh, apparition what they didn't see. 
what they uh, uh, was what they did see the miracle of the spinning and rapidly approaching sun was mm-hmm. it an et disc coming down as the crowd was blocking out the sun uh, which instantly and inexplicably resumed its rightful place in the sky yeah that was a uh, that was pretty pretty strange now weapons of mass destruction are less of a threat to the future of the human race than they have been for decades And more recently, the ET messages have been to stop destroying our environment. Yet we still concentrate on sightings of craft, evidence, and alien technology instead of the imperatives that they are communicating to us to preserve our one and only planetary home. What do you think these spiritual messages are? Why do you think these spiritual messages are being ignored or are they simply not being publicized while we focus on physical evidence and technology instead? Wow. Heck of a statement. Costa? <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to say I agree that the message is important, not just the hardware. Um, and I can't tell you the myriad of reasons why people may be ignoring them. Um, I can speak about life in the United States, not so much in other countries, where the mass media um, doesn't carry messages like this. In fact, ridicules even the hardware part of the of, of the ET presence. Never mind any spiritual messages they might have. Right. Uh, the mass media also keeps us occupied with um, entertaining us or with stupid celebrity stories um, and car chases of the week, uh, and people can get hypnotized by that. Also, don't forget that um, a lot of people are are, uh, struggling in the U.S. to survive these days, as they have in other parts of the world. And so when you're making your daily living and worried about paying your bills, you may not be so interested in listening to these messages uh, should you encounter them. Now, having said all that, it is important that once messages like that come through, whatever method or medium they come through, uh, which is often often people, um, it's, it is important to heed them. Um, all the uh, cool hardware and ET craft in the world won't matter if we as humans continue on the course that we're on and, and annihilate ourselves, either ecologically or through um, uh, poisoning, well, I was going to say poisoning earth and water, that's ecological, but uh, nuclear war and chemical war, other means. Um, this is an imperative. Uh, and we have to learn to love each other. It isn't easy. It's um, my humble opinion is that it's easy to love humanity, but harder to like humans, if you know kind of what I mean by that. Uh, uh, but we still have to learn how to do that and, and to get along um, and build the structures that that will allow us to get along better. Now, having said that, too, the I believe, and many other people on, in our network believe that the ET races, and they no doubt come from many places, are here because we're at a transitional period in our planetary civilization. Um, we, humanity, are really making the choice. We're at a, a, a fork in the road. Are we going to self-annihilate, or are we going to take an incredible leap into the future of you know cooperating with each other and uh, uh, becoming peaceful with each other and taking our next spiritual evolution. I think these other civilizations are not only here to observe, but many of them are here to help. You know, it's quite possible on the planets where they're from that their uh, societies faced this same crossroads and succeeded and not destroying themselves and succeeded instead in going to the stars. So I, I believe they may be coming as ambassadors and as helpers. And many of the messages that uh, uh, your listener, Renee, is talking about are very hopeful messages of, of love and assistance. And I have to tie that back to what our groups do every month that I alluded to earlier when we um, teach people how to make the contact in the field with extraterrestrial intelligence. It's not, again, not just to see the lights in the sky as wonderful as those are, but to make a genuine interactive contact which can be done over time and to offer our own selves as co-creators, as helpers, as uh, brothers and sisters, if you will, to these civilizations who have 
I believe, and a lot of people believe, technical, uh, spiritual, medical, scientific technologies that could really help us if we would just open up and stop sh trying to shoot at them and shoot them down. Um, and we're working towards that. That's really what our core mission is, to train people to go in the field. Uh, start. We've started this movement of, of them doing that and making this communication and actually asking extraterrestrial intelligence, what, what can I do? And the answers can come in a lot of different ways because everybody, no matter what place you're in, you can do something uh, to improve the, the possibility that we're going to survive, you know, something that you can pay forward. Um, uh, well, does the, uh, this, this may sound a little juvenile, but it, it, does the language that is spoken in this communication coming from, from us here on Earth, because we're talking about Japan, we're talking, you know, Europe, yeah. Germany, Iceland, you know, wh whatever. Uh, is is the language important or is the ET able to communicate and understand whatever is being or, or are you guys just speaking English? You know, I, no, we're not. No, we're not speaking English. We we know the world does not revolve around North America. Thank God. Well, uh, but you I, understand. I can't, I, how, I, I can't tell you how the ETs do that. Obviously, they have um, maybe psychic. Uh, telepathic abilities where before words are formed they, they have a way to inject um, knowledge or some kind of a communication that then our traditional th then our brain based on our culture interprets into words or pictures so that it doesn't matter what uh, culture you're from or what language you speak if you get the original core picture it's going to come out in the way that you understand it um, that's that's my speculation and I I don't know how to do that, but hey, you know, when I hear from the Danish people or our Japanese teams that they got a communication, I don't have to ask them, oh, did the ET speak Japanese? They basically just, the people just tell me, I heard it in Japanese words, however it got there. Or the Danes say, I heard this in Danish. You know what I mean? So you can't get hung up on the fact that somehow the language does come out in the way the person needs to. I mean, that is cool. But look at the content of the message after that. That's really what's important. Uh, whether you're Japanese, Danish, German, American, South American, whatever, if the message is of um, love, cooperation, we want you to stop fighting, that's the content you really need to, to, uh, to, to stress at the core. And that's what we're teaching our teams to do. And, uh, it's and, all about co-creation. And when you communicate, you personally, um, how... How are you receiving the communication? How does it hit you? I will get, um, and I, I don't do this as often. I mean, I'm not as successful as often as I'd like to be, but like so many people, the, the more you, you do this, the better you get at it, you know, the more you practice. That's, that's not so, uh, so hard to understand. Right, I, right. Get, um, I get pictures that flash in that I just, in a way, kind of intuitively understand what they mean. And... Um, I'm very I'm very audible, whereas maybe other people might not be. I will hear English phrases and words. Now, what they start out as, I don't know, but when they come out in English, then then I understand them. You know, and that's all I can say there. It's uh, it's customized to me, just as it is to anybody else who might be having the same experience. Daniel, have you gone out with uh, Costa in in a group and? Uh... An attempted communication? No, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to do it up on the retreat up in uh, Toronto uh, later. I think when when is it, cost? Do we know yet when we're going to do this? Yeah, Labor Day. Uh, we're going to be having a an ET Let's Talk uh, UFO contact retreat in Toronto. Oh, okay. Um, four days over the Labor Day weekend, where not only will our friend here Daniel be speaking there, but uh, other luminaries in the field. And at night, we're going to go out uh, uh, under the stars and do our methods here and see what kind of contact that we can make. Now, uh, and you, you had mentioned this earlier, and it, I, I'm trying to cop a visual here. So you, you're out. When, when um, is, is there... Uh, when, okay, obviously we all want to go out and see lights in the sky. You know, that that would be a great thing. Okay, so there's that element of it. But then you also, 
uh, would maybe like to, I'm, I'm speaking personally, maybe shake hands or, or go out and talk to, you know, uh, uh, some type of entity. But do you have a choice about what happens as, as, or is it completely out of your control? I won't say it's completely out of your control because you can put yourself in a state where you, you make yourself available. I mean, if you approach this whole operation of trying to make contact and say you're in an agitated state or you're very skeptical or fearful, uh, if I may talk in this way, the vibrations you set up are not going to really be conducive to you being a good receiver, no matter what kind of communication comes at you. So to that extent, you have control over your own frame of mind, for the, the state of your heart, your intention, your own calmness. Yes, you absolutely have control over that. Now, how the communication comes back, I can't say is with as great a degree of certainty that you have a control over that. They always seem to pick whatever's appropriate, and then there are always surprises. And I love the surprises because uh, uh, these civilizations are benevolent. We've never had bad experiences. And so it's kind of a joy to see something that uh, you hadn't expected show up a as a contact experience. Um, I don't know. Did I answer that question? Yeah, no, totally, totally. Have you guys been videotaping? And uh, is there photography that goes on? People will do that, uh, and they will sometimes post it on our site. Uh, many times uh, they just keep the video to themselves and, and maybe talk about it. Uh, as we, um, as etletstalk.org uh, becomes more folded into ufocontact.com, we're going to be urging people more to publish their photographs, uh, publish their videos. And, and also what we're, we're hoping to do in the future with the, um, the UFO Contact um, app that I mentioned earlier, which not only will allow people in real time to just find each other and just set up a chat and talk, but uh, in a future enhancement, we want to provide the ability for people to take video and then share it with each other and also upload it to the site. So let's say that you're in the field and you've got your smartphone. Uh, and admittedly, a smartphone camera, because of the kind of picture it's supposed to take, which I think is more close up, it may not be the best kind of camera to, to get something that's in the sky or at a distance uh, you know, to resolve it and get a good focus. But... Uh, Nonetheless, it is there if something is close up. You'll be able to use the smartphone with our app, uh, take a video or uh, record some sounds, and then share them across the world with other people in real time. And that's what we really want to see happening, is to, just to get a lot of people out there, a lot of teams doing this um, in real time, uh, because there's nothing like that excitement. Uh, let me give you one story. Um, well, we have, I was just going to say, take me through a typical... Uh, situation but you're going to do that now so yeah th this is something that actually happened uh to to our local team here um in um and i'm in san bruno just south of san francisco we had uh, several members at one of our typical field sites out um under the stars at night uh during one of our monthly events um and they were having a wonderful night uh, because, and this was lights in the, this was a lights in the sky kind of night, but but an, a, a dramatic one because they were seeing repeated starcraft making anomalous moves. You know the the stuff that aircraft can't do, like 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 hover and then shoot up this way and then zigzag that way and then brighten up and then dim down and then reappear somewhere else. They were having a real dynamic kind of contact like that to their surprise they got a text message um, on their um, smartphone from another member who could not join them that night at that site because he was had to be at home uh, for you know family uh, child care probably but he was out in his backyard nonetheless and doing his own uh, contact and they got a message from him going did you see that? Did you see these objects in this part of the sky? And he named, you know, where the stars were, the constellation was, like within seconds of when they spotted it. And they said, of course we did. So there you have it. Two different locations, people that really weren't talking to each other, but they did text message and see the same thing. And that validated it for them, uh, that they saw the same behavior in the sky. 
does this happen a lot? You know, to, wait, because to us or well, no, no, because you have so many different reports that are coming in. You have so many teams, and, and you've got uh, it's it's such a large organization. Do you, do you find that the same reports will come in on the same night where a couple of teams were out? Uh, making contact and it just turns out to be exactly the same time and and spot in the sky. I've had a, a, a couple of those along the way, but in general, um, though our numbers are big, when we when we have two hundred teams in this organized way every month at a time, we're spread out pretty far across the planet. So the odds that two teams will be watching the same part of the sky that might be hundreds of miles apart from each other the odds that those two teams will see the same thing at the same time are are pretty much lessened. Um, now, having said that again, we would love to have 2,000, 20,000, 200,000 teams. So when the day comes that all these teams are geographically closer to one another, then you're obviously increasing the odds that uh, if something happens in the same part of the sky, two teams near each other may, in fact, more often validate each other. So that's what we're working towards. Uh, you know, our our effort here is only a few years old and we're still building. And uh, part of the reason I'm talking to an audience like yours is to encourage people to come join us, you know, at shameless plug, etletstalk.org, so that we can get to that point where we have hundreds and thousands of teams uh, on a regular basis uh, making this contact. And then using our smartphone app, there'll be even a more tightly knit, closer knit community that way, uh, talking to each other in real time. And that's the vision, and we're, we're getting there. Um, I I would love to see some uh, photographs. And the other thing that uh, I think is necessary for for you guys would be uh, a mass experiment. You know, where you where you actually sent you know at, at a at a fixed time. You, you know what I mean? Fixed time. Let's go at nine a.m. Pacific, midnight East Coast. Let's all mm -hmm. focus at the same time and 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 see what kind of results you get. You know, a controlled, uh, something controlled. That's a good idea. Uh, we're experimental, so I will take that under advisement and take it to our membership and see if, if people want to want to try that. It's easy enough. We just make the announcement, people join in, and then we take the reports see what happens now with um uh, i don't have it open right now on the screen uh on your website but what when you click open the the cell phone app and you hit the contact button you're going to have a set of instructions right there take us through that the instructions will be geared either to doing it alone or within a group but at the core they're the same um i mentioned earlier that consciousness uh we are each of us alive beings um, we have a mind that is infinite and we use that um, in a calm quiet uh, meditative kind of way to make our approach to uh, ET intelligence uh, we believe that a lot of these civilizations have not only developed technologically but because of the, of the fact that they're still alive and functioning they've had some spiritual development and that they may be, they are sensitive to the vibrations of what we bring. So our instructions um, ask people to, um, to, to get calm, maybe get in a circle with each other, to sit, uh, to close their eyes, to get comfortable in whatever way is, is normal for them, to center themselves. Right. And then it's a series of visualizations, and people will customize on this, but the, the, the key thing I tell people is, your intention, number one, is what matters. I mean, if it doesn't matter if uh, you're the best meditator in the world. If you're sitting down and you just want to make contact and kick the tires and, and go kick some ET ass or something, uh, uh, that's as unclear on the concept. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. The ideas, the intention, um, we talk about an open heart. We talk about the members of the group visualizing their hearts connected. Uh, to each other in the circle, uh, maybe ro rotating, revolving the um, energy within their thoughts around the circle so that it binds the group. We instruct people to also visualize other groups across the planet. This is a great network. 
and they have uh, friends who are sitting in their living rooms or out in the field, wherever they are, doing the same thing during this 24-hour period. So we encourage people to, in their mind's eye, in their imagination, also visualize like a connection of love and light to everyone else that's in the network. And what I do uh, is I publish the locations every month uh, during this 24-hour period of people who have said they'll join in. And so that it's easy that way um, for you to know that uh, there are groups in Germany doing this, there are groups in England, there are groups in Brazil, and then in your mind's eye to connect to them during uh, during the, uh, the, the contact experience that you're building. Um, from that, you send up a, um, a beam of light, if you want, and into space. Let the ETs know where you are. Chances are, if you've done this a number of times, they've already tuned into you and can do it in again rather easily, so they, they'll know your location. But people still go through through that exercise where they make the invitation. They, they visualize the, the craft that we believe are out there literally by their millions. Uh, and they send an invitation to, to these benevolent civilizations to, to join them, uh, to meet them halfway in whatever way is safe for them and, and for the participants. So that's part of the exercise. Well, I've had, I've, had a, I've had a few guests on the show. Uh, as a matter of fact, Steve Marillo last Friday from MUFON, uh, formerly the director of L.A. MUFON. Um, he said that he, uh, he went out with a team i think it happened a couple of times but uh they they went out into the desert and he had uh one of the there was i think there was maybe a dozen of his friends they're out and he had some kind of small little mag light type flashlight with him something very small it wasn't big mm -hmm. and he literally pointed at the sky and said okay that's that, that's it right there and they were looking at the star that had been stationary. But he said, uh, for a while. And he said, but that's it. He said, watch this. And he took the flashlight. I, I don't know if it was a flashlight or maybe a laser. I don't I don't know. But um, uh, the reason why I say it was small, because I, I have a mag light here in the studio that just kind of, you know, for emergency, you know, sits here. It's one of the small baby ones. And he said it was smaller than this. Okay. So anyway... Bam, bam, bam! Does three flashes at this, at this uh, star, and the star blinked three times back immediately, yeah. and then yeah. he did two, and it blinked back twice. Cool. Now is well. It, so is this is this something that um, uh, that you've heard of before? Is this a technique that you guys use as well? Um, absolutely have heard of it before. Uh, people have tried that before, and they use um, different strength um, lasers to do that, laser pointers. Uh, and I have to say here that uh, uh, people need to be cognizant of the laws in their country about using lasers in the sky because, uh, for example, in the U.S., uh, in many states or maybe across the country, it, it can be a felony to point those like at, at an airplane because you can blind pilots and all that. Sure, so sure, need sure. need to be cognizant, if they're using lasers, that that is their choice, and they need to be careful. Um, we don't use them so much anymore in our group, but I, like I said, every group seems to customize what they do. So those that do that have had the experience. Multiple times I've heard of what you were just talking about, where it's like amazing. It's not an accident. You, you can't say that you didn't see what you saw. You flash three times, it comes back three times. You flash twice, it comes back twice. You can't make that stuff up. No. And, and, it's, and it is exciting because, again, beyond the hardware in the sky, you have to realize there's intelligence behind these. You know, when you sit down and think like, my God, there must be some um, a number of humanoids aboard this craft what are they like? What do they think like? What What are they seeing? Um, what's What do they want to say to us as they blink back? And I think that's what's exciting. That's like what your uh, Colin uh, person there, Renee, was talking about. It's the message. What are they wanting to say? Once you get past the fact the hardware's up there, it's sitting there. It, no, no, no plane can do that. 
it's not a helicopter, we've determined that, etc. Then you focus on the message and on the intelligence behind it. And that takes you to that next level of, well, why are they here? Um, uh, how can I increase this communication? Uh, what can we do together? Uh, someday we hope that during first open contact, and that's what we call it, when they're able to land um, and the game that those who are suppressing them is over um, and, uh, and allowing this first open contact to happen, I think we'll find out a whole lot more that time um, what it is they were trying to say. Um, I personally believe, and so do a lot of people, that 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 is a totally benevolent thing and they're here to help. There are stories of um, craft, and there have even been press conferences that have featured military or ex-military personnel from nuke bases talking about um, yeah, how objects would come down to Washington. ground level and then all of a sudden 18 or 19 nukes on that base would be just disabled. Yeah, that, Not destroyed or anything, but uh, I think, uh, if I can remember now, several years ago this press conference was done and these guys came out and just told those stories. And so you, you have to wonder, the kind of intelligence that can do that is something you have to respect. And then you have to look at the message again. What are they trying to say? If they're shutting down 18, 19 nukes and they're proving that they can do this like nobody's business, like you and I breathe, Aren't they maybe telling us in this message that we've got to stop warring against each other? We've got to stop building these weapons so that we don't annihilate this this beautiful planet. Yeah. I think there's a message there. Well, the case that you're talking about, the Malmstrom case, which I think uh, Daniel was... Uh, Robert Sala. Yeah, yeah. I, I, inter I interviewed him. We selected him to testify, and I brought them to meet with their congressman uh, and stuff. The colonel that was the commander at the base there at Malmstrom and... Also, Robert Sala, uh, I brought those guys to talk to their congressman to right face to face, communicate that stuff to them. <laughs> Say, look, this is not just some minor thing. We have here, you know, three different uh, Nike Zoo, Nike missile sites uh, or Minuteman missile sites that were every single one of the 20 uh, Minuteman missiles that were completely separately wired, uh, all were shut down. Yeah, uh, I had I had yeah. uh, Bob on the show. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, I had him on the show, and yep. his the way that he tells the story, um, and and I had him yeah. start from the morning, you know, yep. <laughs> and, and and take me through every uh -huh. single minute of the day on how yep. that went down. Yep. And my question to him was more direct, which was, yeah. uh, have have you ever in all of your training all of the manuals everything that you've got going on there have you ever had a missile go down like that where it went from green to red and he said no and and i said well what are the odds you know what are the odds of a second one going down <laughs> yeah, right. and it's extraordinary but for him to sit there and have Watch all 20 of them right down. and right after one after a blink yeah. blink blink right. blink blink right. blink it never had happened. Now, he had said that uh, they they called him from upstairs, right? We've got uh, we've got something. Oh, yeah, no, they, they called down right at yeah, the beginning. Yeah. That <laughs> we've, got, we've got this huge orange uh, vehicle, uh, kind of this throbbing light is coming. It's approaching the, the outer perimeter. You know, what are we supposed to do here? And, uh, and Bob actually said to him, he said, your people are armed, aren't they? And he said, well, yes, you know, they have, like, M16s. He said, well, then secure the perimeter, he said. And, uh, and then, the, <laughs> then, the, then the whole vehicle came right up over the top of the entire base, and, uh, and they called back down again into the, into the chute, and they were terrified. The guy said, look at my people. My people are going crazy up here. You know, one of the guys is injured. He tried to climb over the razor wire to get out of the facility, to get away from this thing. And, uh, and Sola said he was just getting set to go wake up the, uh, the major, he was a captain at the time. Bob he was going to go wake up the major, and uh, that's when all twenty of the of the missiles went offline. Yeah. And uh, he called he called upstairs to the colonel, uh, Dennis like Dale or something. The fellow's name was uh, the colonel that was there, and uh, reported it to him. And so the colonel called into NORAD. He uh, Bob probably told you this. So right. He called called into NORAD the the and, and said, "Look at we've got a problem here. I need to tell you uh, that we just." lost all the capacity of all 20 of our Minutemen missiles. And the guy said to him, said, uh, are, you, are you wanting to make a UFO report? 
And he said, you know, it was the most important moment of my entire life because they asked me that. And I just said, I absolutely am. And the, and the guy at NORAD said, well, that's interesting because we just got reports from the one that was the east to the east of you and to the west of you, and they have just had the same thing. Uh, they've had a large UFO come over, and they all lost all 20 missiles. So there were 60 Minutemen missiles up in northern Montana that all went off on that same night. He had uh, he had said this is this is kind of the, the 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 crazy thing for me was that uh, nothing nothing that everything is hardwired. Yeah, they're, okay. so they're separately wired. They're, they're separately. They're not, they're not in a series. They they, they are separately wired. They, one they of those missiles. right. They don't affect one another. Yeah. And so yeah. the the odds are just totally. I, because it's just separate yeah. silos, hardwired to themselves, yeah. and for them exactly. to go offline, it's it, they didn't have any protocol for it. They didn't know no, what to there's do. Not, there's not any question about what happened that night, and the fact that the two bases, the one to their east and the west, had the exact same thing happen at the same time. You know, there's no connections between those other those bases. Uh, they're they're all completely independent. Uh, but you know, there's there's not any doubt what. So ever what happened, you know, and uh, and yet and yet the you know he the, the colonel tried to file a full scale report about it, and and they basically wouldn't do anything about it. They they didn't come and question them anymore. They didn't they didn't ask him for any more reports on it. He said it was just one of the most astonishing things. And, and we sat and, and met with his congressman. His congressman was the chairman of the House Committee on Aeronautics, and his, his congressman said to him, look. Uh, I've got to tell you, I said, he said, I wish I could tell you that they would do something about this here, but the people up here are just too frightened, you know, that they, they would get ridiculed completely. They're, and what we know now from Richard Dolan's work, Richard Dolan, of course, who, who published the two volumes of UFOs in the National Security State, has got copies, has secured copies through the Freedom of Information Act of the top secret classified U.S. Air Force internal memoranda where they actually created a unit to ridicule and attack and to destroy the reputation of anybody who tried to file a report about these things. Which, you know, it's, you say to yourself, wait a second, what is this? You know, I mean, here they're, they're charged with defending the United States, the, air, the airspace of the United States, to get 60 Minutemen missiles turned off one time, and they, they pretend like it didn't happen. Well, that's the easiest way to, you know, to silence somebody or yeah, to no, to right. disc- is just there, attack his character. Children. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Well, that's right. Uh, with with disclosure uh, and your experience yeah. in Washington, is that yeah. something that uh, contact? Well, I I, I want to say ET. Let's talk. But you have yeah. the new website that's launching, so we're in yeah. between names right now. But is that something that you and Costa are going to continue to pursue? Well, sure. Except that you know you, we have to be realistic. You know that, that it's it's perfect. It's perfectly evident that during the period of the Cold War, from that July day, you know, in 1947, when the 501st bomber wing, when the when the craft crashed out by Roswell, and they recovered it, and you know perfectly well they recovered it. Uh, and I've done investigations of that. You know, that there's a you know the famous the famous uh, photograph of General Ramey. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, squatting down uh, next to the next to the uh, the the weather balloon debris. Right. You know the fam- the famous. Uh, you know, th- you could see. Uh, I was. It was 1997. I was out at the International UFO Congress, and a guy came up to me. I did a presentation. A guy came up to me, said, "Mr. Sheehan, I'd like to have you come up and meet with me up in my room. There's something I need to show you." So uh, I, I went and got a friend of mine because I didn't want to get, you know trapped into something, but I went and got a friend of mine to be a witness. We went upstairs, and he said, look, I have found the photographer who actually took the photographs uh, of General Ramey uh, and the, uh, and the, the, uh, the, the, the base, the, the base uh, public relations officer there. He said, and, uh, and so uh, I, I want to know if I go to find him, and he can find the the uh, the original the original uh, film of this. Can you put some funds together to help us develop these? I said absolutely. So he went and, and, and went to the home of the guy, and it turns out the guy still had the original film on which he'd taken the photographs. So what we did is I, I, gave, I gave a call to uh, Bill Todman, 
I, I don't know if you guys are too young, but there used to be Bill Todman Mar- here Mar- in, Mar- yeah, Mar- in, in Burbank. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Well, this, he's the son of uh, Mark Goodson and Bill Todman, who used to be mm. the executive producers for I Love you, Lucy and the $64,000 question. And, oh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, and they were, they, you know, they were extremely wealthy producers. Yeah, huge, and Bill Todman, huge. And Bill Todman Jr., you know, was a very wealthy guy. It turns out I was, I was sitting having a meeting with Bob Ramey, who, you know, uh, Bob, Bob Ramey and Mace Neufeld are the guys that are the producers and directors of Tom Clancy's movies, you know, Patriot Games and, uh, and uh, all that stuff. Right. Uh, the Hunt for Red October and all those. So I was sitting with Bob Ramey, and Ramey was the president of the Academy of Arts and Sciences the group that give the Academy Award. And so I was sitting there talking with Bob Ramey and his his assistant, uh, his assistant, um, what was his name? I'll think of it in a second. But anyway, uh, he said to me, look, I, I'd like to ask you a question. He pulled me aside and he said, I understand that you know stuff about UFOs and stuff like that. And I said, uh, yeah, uh, Nick Grillo, his name was. Nick Grillo pulls me aside and he said, well, I've got a friend uh, who wants to talk to you. Uh, I can't tell you what his name is, but I want you to go. He wants to know if you'll come and meet with him. So I said, sure. If you want me to do it, Nicky, I'll do it. So Nick Grillo and I, he, we get in his big 1964 Cadillac uh, El Dorado convertible <laughs> and drive down the, you know, <laughs> through Beverly Hills, and we go over to this guy's place. We, we go on to the Paramount lot, and he takes me to the, through the gate, and we go in, and it's Bill Todman, Jr., right? So we go in and sit down, and Bill tells me, Bill says, look, I wanted to talk to you because – uh, I, when I was in college, in between my, like, sophomore and junior year, I was climbing in the Rocky Mountains with a friend of mine, and we climbed up into this big meadow in the middle of the mountains, and there was this gigantic UFO sitting right in the middle of the meadow. He said, and I walked over to the thing, right over to the thing, and put my hand right on it. There wasn't any doubt about what it was. He said, then it started to hum, and I stepped away from it, and it kind of rose up in the air, and it just shot away like that. And he said, look, and, uh, you know, I've never told anybody about it because I didn't want to have people ridicule me and stuff. And so I said to him, I said, uh, I said, gee, Bill, I said, you know, you're in a position, you probably have considerable funds. Why don't you talk to some of the other people in town here and put together a fund for an investigative team? And he said, uh, well, I, th- he said, you know, Sidney Sheldon, the guy who writes all these love novels, you know, the famous Sidney Sheldon novels, he said he was a friend of my dad's, Bill Todman Sr., and he is extremely interested in these things. But, uh, and I said, look, would you talk to Sidney Sheldon and uh, yourself and see if you'd like to put some funds together? We get, you know, I've done all kinds of investigations, Karen Silkwood case, the Iran Contra case, all kinds of them. I said, you know, we could put together a full scale professional uh, investigation uh, like, like we would have done at uh, Harvard University with uh, Lawrence uh, Rockefeller. And so he contacted Sidney Sheldon. And Sidney Sheldon, even though he was 80 years old, was still afraid. He was afraid of ruining his reputation. You know, he'd written like 30 books. Right. Uh, and so he goes and he writes, he writes this book called The Doomsday. Uh, what is it? The Doomsday something or other. Uh, Sidney Sheldon wrote this thing all about a young lieutenant colonel in the Naval, Office of Naval Intelligence who gets brought in to, to basically track down people who he is told saw the crash of a, of a highly experimental aircraft, and they want to track them all down to make sure they remain silent about it. Well, it turns out that they had actually seen a crashed saucer. And uh, it's a fiction, uh, but, but the Doomsday Conspiracy by Sidney Sheldon. So he wrote this book, but he still wouldn't do anything about it. They, they, people are so intimidated by the, the ridicule machine, and we've now seen the documents, as I said, that... Uh, that uh, Richard Dolan has gotten the documents. He's put them, published them right in his, his two-volume set of UFOs in the National Security State. We've seen the signed internal memoranda ordering them to attack and destroy the credibility of anybody who tries to make a report about these things. So it's a, the, during the Cold War, from that whole period from 1945 all the way up to 1992 when the Soviet Union dissolved, there isn't any question at all that the national security state of the United States that was created by the National Security Act of 1947 that created the CIA and, the, and then went on to create NSA and everything else, you know, they have, they have viewed the UFO phenomenon as nothing but a potential source of high technology that they could use to make weapons, uh, you know, if they could only get a, get a corner on the market. 
it's the the old Sufi saying is that when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are his pockets. Right. <laughs> and, the, and and that's how that's how the national security state has dealt with the whole UFO phenomenon. That on the one hand they say, "Holy mackerel! If we can get our hands on this technology, you know, we can beat the Ruskies with, to, with this technology." And on the other hand, they're saying, "Let's get this technology because we need to defend ourselves against these people." And that's my the the top level concern I have, and the thing that I'll be talking about a lot on ufocontact.com is the need for our people to organize and to mobilize because it's clear that the national uh, security state people, the military intelligence industrial uh, community, has, has put in billions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars in black programs to actually try to develop uh, military uh, defense equipment against these people against the beings. You know, they've developed, you know, bright pebbles and uh, these other, uh, uh, they're, they're trying to design satellites, you know, that shoot lasers at, at, the, at the, the UFOs and everything else. And that we have, to, we have to stand up as a people and stop this. I mean, this is crazy for, for this, our military industrial complex and intelligence community to be hiding this information from us and trying to design some kind of a weapon system to fight these people when all they're trying to do is get us to behave and get us to, to stop trying to kill each other and stop, you know, when we, when we finally, you know, delve into the very core of the relationship between mass and energy, the very core of the material being of our reality, you know, all they can do is think about making weapons with it. Does you know, Washington, but, but the problem is, does Washington even care? Yeah. Do they care about disclosure and... No, and no, no. They, they, they do not. They, they, there's no – look, at nothing ever gets done in Washington just because it's the right thing to do. That the only way anything gets done in Washington is if it serves the interests of the major corporations that are paying for the elections of both Republicans and Democrats. You know, ever, it, it was that way before, but since Citizens United in a Supreme Court decision that allows corporations – to give direct campaign contributions to to members of Congress, the House and Senate, it's perfectly evident that there's nothing is go, they're not going to do anything other than what those people who finance their elections want them to do, and that they don't want this thing to be disclosed. It, it threatens their their present levels of technology. We all we all know the famous story where in Los Angeles when the Los Angeles City Council tried to pass a resolution to establish streetcars. In, uh, in a subway system in Los Angeles, the Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford, and the B.F. Goodrich Tire Company all put in millions of dollars lobbying to shut down the operation because it would hurt their business. Because L.A. And, is all about cars. It, that's right. So it stayed completely all cars. And, the, and that, that's what they've done. And when you, when you create corporations, which they did in 1868, they created this new animal of corporations that not only immunized the owners of the company against any personal liability for any of the conduct of the corporation, you know, thereby uh, limiting any liability just to the assets of the corporation and not anybody who owned it or owned the stock. But the fact of the matter is they created a, a, a business entity in which because the owners had no liability for anything that they were going to do, the corporation had no conscience whatsoever. Uh, they didn't care about their, their customers. All they tried to do is to maximize their short-term profit. And so, so what they've got there is they've got these corporations that are trying to figure out how to get at this technology, how to utilize this technology to increase their profits. They don't want people to know about it, and they don't want to destroy the value of the petroleum that they still own because they still need to develop that. They have to pump the planet dry. They, aren't going to, they, don't, they don't want this new technology made, be, to be made available, and, and they certainly don't want to do away with war. I mean, because there's, you know, $250 billion a year, $320 billion a year. Now, right. Well, uh, so the military. So how do you how do you put together a lobbyist effort yeah. that is funded by a corporation that is strong enough to manipulate votes? Because that is what is needed until that happens. No, no, you, you can, we, we can't do a corporation to do that because because the corporation is going to have the same problem the other corporations do. They, they're going to lose their way 
that what we need to do is we need to organize our American people. The, 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 the most analogous experience we had was back during, between 1868 after the creation of these new corporations all the way to 1898. Now, it's only a 30-year period. You know, I mean, we're, we're only talking about a time that, that goes back to basically the administration of George H.W. Bush. Uh, back in that time, in 1868 to 1898, that 30-year period, the robber barons rose to power in the United States, the, monop- the corporate monopolists. They rose to power in the United States, and they ended up completely dominating the Congress. They, they bought and sold the senators and congresspeople. They, they owned all the railroads. They owned all the monopolies on the steel corporations. They owned all of the, all of the oil. You know, they they basically they basically took over the complete control of of the entire United States culture, and what happened is the what what happened is the American people responded by creating the Chautauqua movement. The Chautauqua movement was started by the by the United Methodist Church, the Board of Homeland Ministries, and what they did is they they started out uh, at, they had a camp up on Lake Chautauqua up in northern New York up by Niagara Falls. And what they did is they invited all of the people around the country that were going to be uh, Methodist Sunday school teachers to come to their summer camp from wherever they were in the United States with their husbands and wives and the children and to come and spend the summer. And they were training them to understand how these corporations were completely antithetical to the most basic Judeo-Christian social values. Uh, And they were inhuman. Uh, and that they were training their, their teachers to teach the people in the Sunday schools about this. And then uh, and that, that, started, that started in, uh, in 1884. And then in 1887, what they did is they expanded it to invite every social studies teacher in the United States that was teaching high school civics to come to their, to come to their summer school to be able to train their students to understand how antithetical these corporations were. What, what, what do you mean, everyone? Well, they, they they sent out an invitation. They sent out an invitation to anyone who was a high school civics teacher who wanted to come to their to their. You, you got the right idea. What happened is in the summer of 1887, so many people, thousands of people, all showed up uh, at their summer camp. It was like Woodstock. They didn't have enough food for them. They didn't have enough shelter for them. They didn't know what to do with them. And so these thousand people were all at this big camp up in Lake Chautauqua, and all the people around northern New York all brought food into them. They set up tents. They did this whole thing. It was an astonishing event that happened in American history. And what happened is the following year, in 1888, what they did is they, they established regional Chautauquas, where they, they had them in like 10 different sections of the country so they could handle all of this. And the same thing happened. All 10 of them, the high school civics teachers, came to their with them with their some with their for the summer and overwhelmed them but there by by the by the summer of 1917 by the summer of 1917 there were 2000 Chautauquas that were being held across the United States and people like Eugene Debs talked at these things Susan B Anthony talked at these things Clarence Darrow talked at these things that that they became the mechanism by means of which the American people mobilized to raise up an entire different ethos. And what they did is they, they, this Chautauqua movement generated the creation of the American labor unions. It generated the women's suffrage movement. It generated the environmental movement. It generated the anti-child labor movement. It generated the American public school system under, under Dewey, under John Dewey. It generated the original uh, uh, civil rights movement, the post-Civil War civil rights movement. Uh, all of these in the environmental movement, it, it generated the national parks and all that. All of that came from the Chautauqua movement. The problem was that in 1917, in Europe, at the end of the First World War, that what happened is the Bolshevik Revolution took place in, in the Soviet Union, uh, or in Russia, and they set up the Soviet Union, and the, the Bolsheviks set up communism as the absolute total antipode to Caucasian, nation-state-based, state capitalism. Uh, that state-subsidized capitalism. That's what it isn't free enterprise. The, there was ma- they, were, they were getting major tax money to subsidize these major corporations. They were being given the, the 20 miles on each side of the railway lines, were being given by the federal government to the railroads. They gave them 
free access to the to the national parks and everything uh, to drill for oil. I mean, the, this is state capitalism. It's it's not normal free enterprise, and the the because the robber barons had taken over the entire government. And what happened is that the they were they were engaged in an affirmative aggressive movement of of Caucasian nation state based uh, imperial state capitalism. And they were engaged in overthrowing and, and taking over the Philippines, taking over the Hawaiian Islands. They took over. They took over Cuba. They took over a part of Mexico and all of California. This whole period of manifest destiny, uh, the white man's burden, that that it dominated the entire last half of the of the 19th century, and it was the major governing ethos of the country and of the world, the Caucasians. And what happened is the Bolsheviks set themselves up in direct opposition to them. And instead of his Caucasian, nation-state-based, imperial state capitalism, what they set themselves up as is non-exclusively Caucasian, non-nation-state-based, that's international, global, uh, world communism. And that they confronted them as the dialectic. And the American, the American uh, governing class, the entire robber baron class, knew exactly what a threat they were. And they generated a major, and most people don't know this, generated a major uh, uh, foreign military expeditionary force. There was a huge American foreign military expeditionary force was sent into Russia and allied with the white Russians in St. Petersburg and that whole western section of, of Russia to try to crush the Bolshevik movement. That's where it started. And that's where, the, that's where that war started back in 1917. And it's been going, it was going on ever since. And what happened is the Bolshevik movement around the world, the secular atheistic uh, communist movement became the major challenger to, to a global state capitalism like that. And it went on from 1917 all the way to December 31st of 1991. And what it did is it sucked all of the oxygen out of the Chautauqua movement. And so the Chautauqua movement was a spiritually grounded, uh, uh, philosophical, a the, the, theological uh, opposition to, to this selfish, self-aggrandizing, heartless, uh, selfish uh, corporate state uh, capitalism that was going on. And so what we have to do is we've seen it happen again. We saw this as soon as the, as soon as the Cold War ended, as soon as the Soviet Union dissolved, immediately, immediately, it, it dissolved on December 31st of 1991. The following uh, Monday morning, Paul Wolfowitz, who was the, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense under Richard Cheney, right. uh, who was the Secretary of Defense for, for George H.W. Bush, they all gathered together with David Addington and Elliot Abrams and uh, W. Scooter Libby, and they all gathered in the, in the, the West Wing uh, of, the, of the White House, and they gathered, and they generated the 1992 United States Defense uh, Department Policy Planning Guidance Document, in which they advocated what they, by their own term, was the generation of full-spectrum dominance. And that they said that the United States should take this unique moment in history, since we're the last and only uh, superpower on the planet, we should establish absolute military hegemony in the world, and we should not allow any other country or any other entity to generate a military threat that could challenge the superiority of United States military forces at any point on the planet. And they said so. It was just flat out. And, they, and they, they actually circulated a copy of that memorandum on February 18th of 1992 to certain select members of the cabinet and certain select members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And the Washington Post got a hold of it. And they wrote an editorial calling this raw capitalism and, and raw imperialism, saying this was nothing more than just a transparent, immediate return to the same robber baron uh, worldview that dominated uh, the, uh, the whole Western civilization at the end of the 19th century before the rise of the Soviet Union. And it, it, it wasn't surprising. They went right straight back to the same ethos that they had beforehand. And that's what we're facing right now. And in the, the, the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party, ever since the rise of, the, of, of National Socialism or state socialism all around the world, that the Democratic Party was just acting as the soporific. You know, the Republican Party had always advocated the same raw, selfish, big business, uh, capitalist, racist, you know, uh, 
you know, uh, chauvinist, uh, Caucasian superiority bullshit. They always say the same exact thing. And what happened is the Democratic Party viewed themselves as having to act as the buffer. Say, look, we better not let those policies get implemented that way, or else it's going to just generate massive support for communism all around the world. Well, when We've you look at it, an alternative. when you Pardon? look at it, when you look at it in those terms, yeah. then then how does anything get listened to uh, in Congress and in Capitol Hill? Let alone it's the. It's not going to. It's not going to. There, 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 there's nothing. There, everybody's trying to pretend that they're being held hostage by these 32 right wing uh, Tea Party congressmen in the House of Representatives. That's all crap. You know, the fact of the matter is those people are basically espousing what the, the right-wing Republicans have espoused for 50 years, for 100 years. And, and they're all pretending like they're paralyzed by it. And now they have to just now – and you just see the country sliding farther and farther to the right. Well, I mean, they just, they just passed the National Defense Authorization Act, Jimmy. They just passed the National Defense Authorization Act that authorizes the United States military to arrest any American citizen anywhere in the country – without any probable cause to believe that they've committed any crime whatsoever, the military can take them into custody. They have no right of habeas corpus. They have no right to be brought in front of a magistrate to make a determination if they've got any probable cause to believe they've committed a crime. They can hold them indefinitely, just like they do at Guantanamo. Uh, they can hold them there. They can put them in front of a military tribunal. They have no lawyer. They have no right to an attorney. They put them in front of a military tribunal, and the question is whether or not these people are suspected of providing any type of significant assistance to any organization that the executive department has unilaterally declared to be an organization that harbors hostile intentions toward the United States or any of our allies. That's the statute. And, and, they, and they passed it, you know, when, when it was introduced by these right-wing yahoos in the House of Representatives, the ACLU said, oh, nobody has to worry about that, they're never going to pass that. Uh, but they, but the, but the, the conservatives in the Republican Party were so afraid of being viewed as soft on terrorism when they proposed this right. that they all voted for it. Right. And then the, Demo- the Democrats said, "Wait a second, we don't want to look like we're soft on terrorism, so we're going to support it too." Well, nobody and, wants to. Well, not only well, you're you're talking about politicians, but you have to talk about American citizens as well. They don't. I don't want to be the guy, and my neighbor certainly doesn't want to be the guy that that is also looking soft. You know, well, we have to, and, and and so that fear, right? That fear that that you have to have a fear to control. So okay. that that fear allows us all to look at each other and go, you know what? If we just give up a little bit, just right. a little bit of that freedom. Right. You know that that it's little just, piece that that'll be okay. Yeah. Well, then what's, what's, you what's, notch what's it up. Like, you, I, I don't I don't mind I don't mind giving up my constitutional rights. I wasn't using them anyhow. It, well, exactly, <laughs> but that's exactly right. So now it's okay to take off your shoes before you get on a plane. It's okay right. to have a head, body scan. Let them, let them grab your crotch. You yes, know, bend it, over, hold your hold your ankle. Right, right. You know, let them take X rays of your of your naked absolutely. Body. You know, and, and what I'm saying is is that the that this cannot be tolerated. It's just like Raver Niemuller said back during the 1930s in Germany, the famous quote. said, you know, when the, the Germans, the, the Nazi government, after 1933, when, when Hitler became chancellor, said, you know, when they started passing these statutes in the, in the Bundestag, he said, you know, gee, they, at first they were only picking up Jews anyhow, and I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't do anything about it. Right. And then, then they went for labor union people, or, or socialists, and I wasn't a socialist, so I didn't do anything about it. And then they went for labor union people, and I wasn't a labor union person, so I didn't do anything about it. And so they finally came to get me, and there wasn't anybody left to help me. Right. You know, and, and so the, this, this, is, this is the classic, not to be trite, but it's the, it's the, it's the frog. You know, you take, <coughs> you take a frog and throw it in boiling water, and it'll jump right out. But you put it in warm water, and it'll sit right there, and you turn the heat up, and it'll start to boil, and it'll cook. No, but that's exactly it. And if you just notch it up, notch it up, notch it up, notch it up, the next thing you know, you've got yeah. nothing left. And you know, the, the 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 parts about this this country, not only this country, but this radio show, and freedom of speech, those uh, uh, the the basic freedoms that we do have, are the things that we need to constantly look at every single day and ask yourself: Are you willing to give that up? You know, are you really the the things that make this country great? The reason why I am able to 
travel in between states and 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 not be monitored and 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 not and photographed not your papers right you, know, you, you, you don't have to no. you know and, and it's, it's, it's it's the and they said the verb and that's why i'm a constitutional litigator and that's how i end up in the places that i end up in these type of large confrontations that we have because what they said the founding fathers said the cost of liberty is eternal vigilance that's right. And, you, and you've got to be prepared. You've got to understand, if you let these people have that power, they will always abuse it. They will always abuse it. And so you have to be willing to oppose these people. You know, and, and the, the, this, when, when the National Defense Authorization Act finally was passed, everybody kept saying, oh, Obama will never sign that. He'll, he'll veto that. Well, he ended up signing it at 11.55 midnight on New Year's Eve of 2011, when everybody else was jumping around in, in, in uh, downtown New York in the, in, the, in the Times Square, and people were all partying and watching the parade the next day and New Year's Eve watching football games. They, they, it became old news by the end of the week that he had signed this thing. And, uh, and he keeps saying, oh, I'm not going to really use it against anybody. If you're not going to use it against anybody, why have you got it? You know? And they all, they all just keep thinking that they're, they're doing this to placate the right wing. That's exactly what Hitler did. Hitler intimidated all of the other people to, to the left of him. As they said, they didn't want to look like they were opposing Germany getting back on their feet after World War I. And, uh, and that's what's happening right here. And so what I'm saying is that people have to, for example, they have to go to their city councils and get the city council to declare their city to be a constitutional protection zone, just like we did with the nuclear free zone. After we did the Karen Silkwood case and the Three Mile Island case, I was chief counsel on both of those cases, you know, and we, we, got, we struck down as unconstitutional the financial cap that the Congress had tried to put on the amount of money damages that could be awarded against a private nuclear plant that contaminated everybody in the neighborhood, right? Right. And so we knocked that cap off. We won a $10.5 million judgment against the Kermagee Nuclear Corporation in Oklahoma. And uh, from that point on, no insurance company would insure them. <clears throat> right, and so that they couldn't they couldn't build any more of them, and so what they said is, oh look, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to renew the licenses of the 103 private nuclear power plants that we already have in the United States, even though their manufacturers said they can only be run safely for 25 years, they're all getting that old now, and what they decided the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, was going to do is just renew their licenses. But in order to do that, they had to take all of the nuclear waste materials from the nuclear facility that had been buried on those sites of those facilities. They had to dig them up, and they were going to, they were going to drive them on trains and in trucks all across the country and bring them to Yucca Mountain in Nevada. And they were going to bury them under, in a big, huge cave under Yucca Mountain, which turned out to be right over the major aquifer in the southwest. Uh, they're you still know? building it, though, right? Uh, but yeah, they're, sure they are, because they keep trying to pretend they're going to do it. Right. But we've stopped them because we got the city councils to pass a resolution declaring their town a nuclear-free zone, that no truck and no train was going to be legally allowed to come into their jurisdiction carrying any of those nuclear materials. And we asserted ourselves. We got the, the city councils to do it. We got county boards of supervisors to do it. We got state assembly districts to do it. And what we did is we froze them in place, and that's why they couldn't build any of these things, all right? So we have to do something similar to that with the, with the, the National Defense Authorization Act. We need to get our city councils to declare their, their jurisdiction to be a constitutional protection zone. Everybody here is guaranteed the right of habeas corpus. Everybody here is guaranteed the right to an attorney. Everybody is guaranteed the right not to be taken into custody unless there's probable cause to believe that they've committed a specific crime. They have a right to a jury. They have a right to a defense attorney. They have a right to cross-examine their witnesses. All the things that are explicitly denied to them by the National Defense Authorization Act, if the executive branch makes a unilateral determination that you're giving significant aid and assistance to a group that they've designated is harboring hostile intentions toward the United States. So when, when, the, in, when the ACLU filed the lawsuit against them in New York City in the Southern District of New York in the federal court, the, the, uh, the, the ACLU was representing um, uh, Chris, Chris Hedges and Dan Ellsberg and a few other friends of ours, and they all came in and filed a lawsuit saying, look, this statute could be applied against us. 
if we if if we if hedges like writes an article about the Hezbollah or uh, any of the other terrorist organizations, and the administration happens to think that it's not adequately hostile to them, that it's giving them aid and comfort, you know, they thought they could be arrested. And the judge said, oh, that's not going to happen. Here, look, I want the U.S. attorney to stand up right now and say that that would not be covered under this statute. And the U.S. attorney said, I'm not going to say that. How are you going to – you need the same mentality, the, the same – genius and assertiveness to mold into an approach for disclosure and i don't know how you're going to do it but you're the right guy to do it i i I think it's a it's it's a huge mountain in front of you costa certainly you've got the right guy working for you there's there's no time that's true and what i want to add to that is we've um, got we've got exactly guys we've got 60 seconds here okay uh, to wrap up just say that my piece of this is that uh, with the brilliance of Danny and whatever he's going to come up with to, to to deal with disclosure in this way, what we can do and what we are doing is in the people's disclosure movement is training our teams to do what governments won't do with disclosure. We're doing it ourselves. Uh, we have the simple methods and we will have millions of people um, being their own experiencers and they won't need the authority. They won't need uh, the government's um, okay to tell them what they saw or what they didn't see. People are out there doing it themselves now, and in increasingly large numbers, they're going to be doing more of that. And this will bring uh, a worldwide consciousness raising about the uh, ET presence here that will be unstoppable when you have eventually hundreds of millions of people who know they're here because we have determined it as the people. We're taking it into our hands. And we just won't allow, we will not allow our national security state people to try to wage war against these people. We just aren't going to allow it. We have to rise up and stop this. This is, this, is a, this is a tragic mistake that can condemn our human family to absolute destruction. You know, that, that, that our peop- that we, we cannot stand for this. We don't have to stand for it. Uh, and so we're going to mobilize and rise up and communicate the information to the people to stop this from happening. And this is the only country that you have that kind of freedom. That's you know, right. No, that's absolutely right. And we have to use it while we still have it. Exactly. Thank you, guys. Thank both of you. Uh, Terrific, Jim. Daniel. Oh, just a fantastic show. Thank you very much. I've got to roll straight into music, so I'm just going to say good night. Good night. <laughs> thank you very much, Jimmy. We appreciate night, it. No, thank you, guys. See you next time. Yeah, exactly. You guys have a great night. Terrific. You too. Great. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Costa. Et Let's Talk dot org. They're, you know, they're moving the website over. If you go to uh, Et Let's Talk dot org now, all the information is there, and the new website is up, and and you can do everything that you need to do, and all of the links are there at uh, JimmyChurchRadio dot com. Um, okay, now tomorrow or next week. I want everybody to have a good weekend. By the way, have a have a great time. Do everything that I would do. And next week, we're going to have on John Major Jenkins. That's right. And we're going to be talking about not only what didn't happen in 2012 with with all of the Mayan stuff that was supposed to go down, but the stuff that did go down and what is happening now in 2014. And nobody knows the Mayan calendar better than John Major Jenkins. And then also next week, David Marler is going to be on the show. Black Triangles. He's got his new book out, Black Triangles, Richard Dolan Press. And that'll be on Friday. On Wednesday, I've got a surprise. It's going to freak everybody out. He might be from another network. Keith, you know what I'm talking about. I think it's going down Wednesday. So, everybody, have a good weekend. Thank you. Coming up next, uh, I think we got Michio Kaku. And then, uh, of course, After Dark Live with Brian Alvarez. Special thanks to Keith Rowland and Art Bell. Fade to Black is produced by Rita Kamurian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm and Mark D. Kovar. Announcers are Steve Harder and Mark D. Kovar. Music, Doug Aldrich. You're listening to him right now. Fade to Black is produced by 
KJCR for the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Have a good weekend, everybody, and we'll see you next week. See ya.